All right. Hello out there, everybody. Let me make sure. Yeah, I think we're all good to go. Um, today, we're going to go over building oh, a saving and loading system in Unity, essentially just a way to save and load game state um, across a, a variety of different types of games, I guess. So a somewhat generic way to save a bunch of different game state. Talk about player prefs and serialization and a couple other things, and then maybe get into some um, online or cloud save stuff too. If we have enough time and we can get there, then we'll go into that too. Talk about how you can kind of convert the local saving stuff that we'll go through into something that just saves remotely pretty easily. And I think we'll do that with PlayFab because I've played with it recently and it was pretty easy to use and pretty simple to get set up with. All right, um, I guess before we get started, I just wanted to say hello and thanks everybody who's here watching live and thanks everybody who comes by and joins later. Don't forget to hit the um, thumbs up button and subscribe and all that stuff. I'm not gonna ask a million times, just this once for now. Go ahead and hit those before we get started. And um, what I'll do is switch over to a new view. We'll start with an empty project. We'll go through making out like a, a very basic little game, maybe something where we can move around a little bit, change the state of some things, and then make it so that we can save that stuff off. Then we'll just kind of build on it from there. So we'll start with something really simple, maybe just save a player position and then start moving objects, save those, save colors, states of uh, random different things, whatever kind of stuff we can come up with. Um, if people have suggestions in chat as we're going along, let's see if we can integrate those into the project as well. All right, I'm going to switch over to desktop mode for just a minute and give everybody just a real quick view. So we're right now in the currently the latest version of Unity as of this morning. Um, and it, we're gonna just, I guess, build a project now with the empty thing. So sorry, I talk so fast and so much sometimes I kind of like lose my breath and my train of thought there. We take a drink and then we'll get going with a really simple empty project. I didn't want to start with, by the way, a already built project because I want to make sure that everybody can follow along and see how they could integrate this right into their own project and not have to go through the process of like trying to dissect my existing game or my existing thing and see how it would work in theirs. This would be something simple that you can take and really see how you can just add in whatever special custom properties that you have into your own into your own systems, into your own games. Try to make it as actionable as possible and usable as possible for your other stuff. All right, so let's get going. We've got an empty project here, and um, this is just in 2020.2.2 F1. So I, I think this was the latest one as of this morning. And I think what I want to start with is just a, a simple character that can run around real quick and save off its position because the thing about saving stuff like i don't know i don't i almost feel like i should just blab about saving stuff may i'll just do it while we build things so i'm going to set up a really simple scene that we can run around a character in while we just talk about saving characters and saving um saving data because depending on your game the amount of data that you save is going to vary quite a bit i'm going to grab pro builder real quick just so we can put together a quick little world. So in the package manager, just go to Unity Registry. And I actually, I'll just scroll down and need to search for it. There's not that many things in here. Grab Pro Builder, install it, and I'm gonna add the package. This will just let me build out a real quick little level so that I have something I can move a player around on and then um, know whether or not it actually moved. Or, or not really know if it moved, but know if I'm saving off the position. So I'll, I'll have places that I can move around to and have it some, some point of reference. If I just move in empty space, and all I can really do is look at like the transform positions and that's oh, kind of boring and, and lame. So <laughs> let's get at least a little tiny world up here. So here I've got Pro Builder set up. I go to Tools, Pro Builder, Pro Builder window. Gives me this little pop-up and I can hit the plus to bring up the new shape tool, make a new cube. It's right now defaulted to 15 by one by 15. That's I think just because that's what I used last. Um, I like to make a lot of floors like this. And then I just hit build. You can pick a bunch of different shapes, by the way. I'm just going to do that, build it, and use that as my main piece. And I've got this cube here. If I close this shape tool, that preview object will go away. That's just like a little thing. So you can build it, see what it looks like um, before you've actually created it. But it goes away when you close that window. All right, so now i got the cube here. Um, it's positioned at 0, 0, 0. Looks good. Close out Pro Builder, and let's add a character. I'm going to start with um, just a capsule for my character, and then maybe we can go grab an asset from the asset store something that animates and runs around once we have more things to save off. So we'll start with something simple though, just a quick little 3D object, make a capsule and we'll reset the position. I'm gonna switch tools too, cause I'm on the rec transform tool for UI stuff and it doesn't make a lot of sense for this mode. All right, so now we're on the move tool, which is just W for the hotkeys, by the way, I'll move this over here. 
In fact, let's just hold V and snap. Ah, it's not snapping there. Let's just move it right over. Actually, I'm going to reset it. Reset the position. Drag it over. No, I'm going to reset it to zero, zero, and then I'm going to move the ground. So I'm going to switch this into snapping mode. Move the ground over here. Move the ground over here. And then down. And down right here. So I think I want to go at... um. Where do I want to put this at? I want to put my player up at zero, but I want his pivot to be down there. Actually, I don't really care. So I'm just gonna move the ground down to be, I'm gonna put the ground at zero and I'm gonna move the player up. I was trying to think of how I wanted to position these things, but thinking about it more, it doesn't really matter what the position of my player is. I'm gonna be saving this thing off anyway, so let's just do that. I've got my cube here now and I've got my capsule or player there. I'm gonna rename this to player. So just hit F2 and type player. And then I'm gonna grab my quiet keyboard so you guys don't have to listen to me type the whole time. I knew I would forget something. I got this thing intentionally just for when I'm streaming so that I can type and people don't have to hear all of the clicks. Um, and then I always forget to grab it out. So basically the same keyboard just in a silent mode, but without the 10 keys, which surprisingly I use a lot more than I thought I did. When I tried to switch to just using this thing without the 10 keys as my primary one, it didn't work very well because I find like I'm constantly just hitting things over there, putting in, putting in numbers and stuff. All right. So now we've got our player here, we've got our cube here, and I've got a quieter keyboard set up. Let's save off. Um, by the way, I'm just hitting Control S constantly to save. It's just a habit. So if you're wondering like why the star is disappearing and I'm not saying anything, it's just because I can't stop hitting it. All right, so now let's make it so we can move this character around. I'm gonna create a script real quick, just like a simple player script that'll let us move the object. And then we'll, um, yeah, then we'll go from there to actually save off what we've moved. So let's add, uh, first I'm gonna add a rigid body. I'll add a rigid body component right down here, which you can't see because it's right down behind my head. So let's bring it up here so that it's not behind my head. So now you can see I've got a rigid body here and I'm going to add some constraints. I'll collapse out the transform. I wanna freeze the rotation of this thing because I don't want it to just roll around and I'm just gonna make it move with some simple velocity. And I think I'll change the collision detection to continuous and save that off. Then I'm gonna add a component. So right below here, right underneath where you can see, let me just drag my head down there. I'll hit add component and we'll type in a script name. I'm just gonna name this player and hit enter. Ah, oh, it added this player quit handler. Let's remove that. I'm gonna go in and create a new scripts folder and just create it in here. So I'll go right click, create folder scripts. Go into that folder, right click, create C sharp script and I'll name this player. That script, by the way, I think is something with one of the packages that, uh, let me hit add component again. Player quit handler. If I add it in, I bet if I click on it, yeah, it's part of, oh, the test runner framework. So that's what it is. That's where it came from. I'm going to remove that though and add the player script that we actually created. All right. So that, that was in the packages, by the way, that other script, in case anybody was wondering where that thing came from. I'm going to minimize packages and just look at our actual code. So we've got our player script here. Let's open it up. And today we're going to be working in Rider. So if you haven't used writer it's um just the code editor just like visual studio or visual studio code or mono develop it's just a nice one made by JetBrains that i really like so i recommend people use it but it's not free they do have a free trial i pay for it because i love it and i think it's worth the money but you can use whatever you want to follow along with this you don't have to use this editor the only thing that will be different is that your shortcuts might be a little tiny bit different and your um your like hints and tips that it gives might not be quite as good. And they might be better if you got a better editor than mine, but in my experience, writers got kind of the best recommendations for stuff. So in my player script, um, since this is really just gonna be about persistence, I just want a simple way to move. I think what we'll do is just set the velocity of this rigid body based on the input of our, our keyboard or whatever using the input system. Another option would have been to maybe use like the nav mesh system and then save off the destinations and stuff. I think we might do that later, but let's, I think I want to start with just simple moving around so I can push things and kind of like wiggle around stuff and see, see how that works first. So we'll go into Unity or into, not Unity, into Rider. I'm going to zoom this all down, get rid of the start method because we don't need it. We'll get rid of that comment about the update and these extra using statements that we don't need. Get it all down to just the update method here. And the first thing that we want to do is just read our input. So we just want to grab horizontal and vertical. And we'll just use the um, the version one or old input system. We're not going to use the new one because that'd be giant overkill, I think, for what we need to do. 
all we really want to do is read the horizontal and vertical input. So we'll say var, or I'll, I'll call it out as a float float horizontal equals input dot get access horizontal. And again, we're going to keep the gameplay stuff and all this very simple so that we can get into persistence. And then we'll copy that and make a vertical one. So just copied it, pasted it, copy and paste, go back and capitalize that V. The casing on these names does matter. It matches up with the axes and the edit project settings and you go to input manager you'll see there the names are all there and they have to match case wise all right so we've got our horizontal and vertical and then i want to just set the rigid body velocity in that direction or something like that times the speed so first let's cache that rigid body i'll add an awake up here and just say underscore rigid body equals get component rigid body probably not super important to do but i figure why not cache that up get rid of the private keyword turn this into an expression body method and get rid of that and shrink it down into something relatively small. Now on line 13, I'm gonna say rigid body dot set velocity or no dot velocity equals. And here I want to set it to something that's using my horizontal and my vertical. And I'm just gonna name that um, let's name it velocity. Whoops. And then generate a field for it or generate a local variable for it. So it'll be a vector three named velocity. It'll be equal to a new vector three. We want to give it an X. So this will be along like our left and right axis and then a Z, which will be our up and down so for up and down that's going to be our vertical which is w so that would be the last parameter of the z and for left and right it's going to be our vertical so we'll put vertical there and then a zero for the y because we don't want the character going up and down we just want it moving on the let's go look at it. we just want it moving on this axis this x-axis right here the blue one and the red axis right there the z one all right so we'll put in a zero for the y and then a horizontal for the z i think i might have just mixed those up um, it's okay if I flipped them, which I think I did, then we'll know in just a minute when I hit play and it's all inverted on my controls. Well, I'll know when I'm hitting them. You won't because you probably won't see the keys that I'm pressing. All right. So that should be enough to push our character in the direction that we want. We don't have any speed control, but let me just go make sure that it works and then we'll continue on and then we can start saving off our player's position as the first thing that we do. All right. So we're in and I can move this. So this is W, which should be going forward. This is S, which should be going backwards, and here's left and right. So I did mix those up, and I also definitely need to change my camera position. My camera position is all kinds of messed up. So before we go around fixing anything else, let's fix the camera position. So I'll take the camera right here. I'm in pause mode, and I'm just going to drag it up here and get a quick view of what it looks like, and then hit E to rotate it, move it down a little bit, unpause, and then start moving around. Okay, so here, again, my controls are mixed up, but... I can see my character and I just wanted to get an idea if this was going to be a reasonable view. I think it is for now, but I'll definitely change it. So I'm going to stop playing. Well, actually, first I'm going to copy this transform position. Do right click, copy component, stop playing. Does it say move the camera back? Yeah, I'm going to move the, oh, I see what you're saying. I'm going to shrink. I'm going to shrink my head, everybody. I hope you guys don't mind. My background is going to shrink and look a little bit smaller, but I want to get myself out of the way. All right, so I've copied that transform position here. I'm gonna uh, stop playing and now I'm gonna paste the transform position again. Where is it? Paste, paste, component values. There we go. Get my camera back up where it goes. And then let's um, switch that code up. So go back into Rider and I just need to move these parameters. I believe it is, there we go. Control Shift Alt, by the way, to just move a parameter. So select it, Control Shift Alt and left arrow moves it to the left. That's just in Rider. Um, there's hotkeys are different in all the other editors, but. Writer's got a lot of cool ones like that, and that's one of the reasons I like it. So I'll save, go back into Unity. I think I'm going to move the camera maybe a little bit more, but let's hit play and see it first. So let's see, is it is it building? I think it's doing a compile real quick. Yep. All right, so hit play. Come in. I go left. Yep, that's A. S is bringing it closer. D goes to the right, and W goes forward. Perfect. Now we can move. Let's add some speed and then start saving off positions when we stop playing and then resave them when we start simplest version of saving and persistent stuff so first though speed we'll add a serialized field up here for a speed variable so we'll go serialized field and then make a float named underscore speed and i'll give it a default of three um i would put the f there and get rid of this private keyword uh one was way too slow i'm thinking three seems like a good default so we'll find out but i want to make it adjustable i'm going to take this speed and i'm going to multiply it by the velocity but I also want to do one other thing, just because we're moving um, and we're moving with WASD, 
there's a problem that a lot of people always run into where they don't normalize their input and then they use the vector like this. And it essentially makes it so that you can go faster if you strafe. So if you go W and D, you'll get a little bit of a speed boost. You get like a 1.414 speed or basically a 40% speed boost um, versus going the other way. To fix it though, we can just do dot normalized here and that will bring the vector down so that it will shrink down and not um, basically not give you a speed boost when you strafe. That's why some games, especially older games, you'll see a lot of the time you get a little bit of a speed boost if you're strafing. Um, this is an easy way to address it usually. So there we go. We've got our speed and our velocity is now um, normalized. Hit play. Try it out one more time. All right, we run around and there we go. Okay, my player is working and it's time to start actually saving things off. All right, and somebody was asking in chat, there's a lot of chat about um, why, why to use Rider over some of the other editors. And I just really wanted to briefly say that the reason that I like Rider, by the way, I should have zoomed that up, sorry. The reason that I like Rider so much is really just the hints and tips and stuff that it gives. It gives a lot of really good feedback and when it recommends things, it usually gives a really good article and explanation that JetBrains has written on why it's recommending that. So that's really why I like it. I just find it to be a fun, cool um, like way to learn new things about stuff. Whenever something pops up, I can just go click, read the article, and learn like why it's recommending this thing, what I could be doing better, and um, like this just like little constant learning bit that I get every day just from using the editor. All right, so let's start saving stuff off. Now, the simplest way to save things is just writing stuff out to player refs. And we're going to start with the simplest and then build upon that and then start adding more and more complication to it. First thing that we have right now, the only thing that changes in our game is the player's position. So we'll just save that off. So when we stop playing, the player's position saves. When we start playing, we reload the player's position. In fact, we could even do it like on enable or on disable. But yeah, in fact, let's do it there. Let's do it in on enable and on disable. So on the player script here, we'll add an on enable. Um, let's add this up here okay, on enable and I'm only adding it up here just to fix the positioning for the camera right so on enable we will save or no on disable let's start with on disable starting with on enable is probably the wrong way to go so we'll start by saving our code so on disable we'll just save off our position now the easiest way to save something in unity is to just write with player prefs so we'll start that way we'll go player prefs dot set and if you go, hey, I want to set like um, my position, you see that there's obviously not a way to do it. There's set float, set int, and set string. So we could use any one of these. Well, we couldn't use set int, but we could use set float or set string. And there are two different ways to do it. I guess let's do, um, let's do the set float way first, and then we'll go into setting a string and serializing after that. So one thing we could do is set a set of variables for our player's position, like player X, player Y, and player Z as three separate floats. Then we can read those back in and just reset our position to those. And that's what we'll do first. So the first key that we'll set in our player prefs, which is short for player preferences, a way to easy way to save stuff off um, and load stuff, I guess. And it works cross platform. So the first key, I'm gonna shut up now and just write in the key, is going to be player. Um, and then we could give it, and the rest of the name could be position X or position dot X or dash X. I think I'm just going to do player X. So this will be player X and then we'll give it a value and that'll be the transform dot position dot X value. So this will just write off the X into our X player X floating point field that's going to get saved off. I don't know how to say it any other way. Now I'm going to copy this line. In fact, watch this. I hit control D, control D because I'm in writer and it'll just duplicate my line for me. Cause, hey, that's how Unity does it, right? So it makes it match. It's freaking awesome. I'll change these this to Y to a Z or X to a Y and then to a Z and then make sure that these match. If I missed those, it'd be a big giant mess. And that will save off my positions X, Y, and Z values. Pretty simple, right? Now we'll just add an on enable and do that. I'm just going to copy on disable, paste it in here, get rid of these private keywords because we just don't need them. I'm going to minimize the on disable and then change this to on enable. Now in on enable, instead of setting floats, I'll get them. So I'll change all of these S's. Just hold alt, click and drag over the S's right here. Change them to G's. Now they're get floats. Now get float doesn't take a second parameter, just takes a key and returns back a float. So I cut this out. I'll just go open, close parentheses and closing a semicolon. Then we'll cut this part right here. So select it all again, just holding alt and clicking and dragging. Shift delete. 
delete, delete, and then hit home and paste, and then do an equals, and that doesn't work, right? But what we can do is say that we'll save these off into variables. So we'll say var of those is getting set to those. So I've got an X, a Y, and a Z now getting read from my players X, Y, and Z. And then we just say transform.position equals new vector three, and we give it the X, Y, and Z. Oh, add the semicolon there at the end, and we should be good to go. So now this should save our player's position, the X, Y, and Z, very, very easily. Um, well, I guess there's not much to it. All right, let's go try it out real quick, make sure that it works, and then let's get into serializing it out and saving it as a string instead. So we'll hit play. And oh, what happened? Our player has disappeared. And the reason for that, if I go select them, is that, well, when we tried to load it, let's go look. We load it up in here and we get a zero back here. So because this doesn't have a default value, if I hit comma here, you'll see there's an option for a default value. The default is just gonna be whatever a floats default is, which is zero. Since I don't have any of these set, I'm just getting back zero, zero, zero. And because I spawned my player up above zero, 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 which I guess I'm kind of glad I did, he's spawning down here and then just falling down forever. So the easy way to fix this is to go back into our code and make sure that we actually have this set. So we can just copy this key right here, this player X, and it's in our on enable say, if player prefs dot has key, and then we put in our key name, and then make that a condition for actually loading up our, our position here. So save that off, there we go. So now we'll change it up so that we only save our, or we only load our position if we actually have saved one. Of course, now we've already got one saved, so it's um, oh, it's gonna be falling down at whatever that weird position is. So let's stop playing and reset our player prefs. So you can do that under edit, and then there's a, where's that option? Clear all player prefs, right here. Third from the bottom in the edit menu. Pops up this little dialogue, hit yes. Thanks again to whoever showed me that. I forget who it was now, but you know, lifesaver. Great feature, one of my favorite things in, in this version of Unity. All right, so let's hit play again, and now it should not load that invalid position. There we go, it didn't load the position because we hadn't disabled it. All right, so let's run around real quick. I'm gonna move just over here, stop playing, and I'm gonna play again. And there we go, we're back at the position that we were at, and if I run over here to the right, just kinda hang out back here, stop playing, play again. You see that it's saving and it's now loading up my data as soon as I start playing again. All right, let's jump back into Unity and let's change this up a little bit because I think anybody who's done a lot of player prep stuff and who's done it this way knows that eventually, like if you do it this way, what you'll end up with is you're saving three floats here and you wanna save off the rotation and you're saving some more floats and then you wanna save some other values or saving more floats. And you start adding more and more and more of these keys in here and it gets to be kind of a pain to manage and you end up having to build like a big management system for it um it can definitely be extremely confusing i would say it, it, it can get complicated really fast and the easier way to do it or the way that i generally like to do it when things are going to get complicated is to just switch over to a serialization model where we take the data that we have that we want to save off serialize it out, and then just write that all out at once, either in a JSON format where it's just JavaScript uh, or JavaScript object notation. So it's essentially like a key value pairs that are human readable, or you can serialize it out in a binary format, or you could do like a JSON serialization and then encrypt it later. There are a bunch of different options on how you wanna actually store the data, but serializing it in general is just a way to save off a bunch of different data without having to make all these different keys and manage how everything is saved. It's essentially going to automatically generate the keys and values for you. That's kind of what serialization does. All right, let's go through that process real quick with the position. Then we can look at what that serialized data looks like, what the file looks like that, well, what the data looks like that it'll give us and maybe shove it into a file, see how we can save that into a local thing. And then just keep going from there, start building in more things and start hooking up um, more objects and things so we can like move things around, attach stuff, all that kind of other fun stuff once we get into it. All right, so let's go through that process. So instead of saving off player X, Y, and Z, let's just save off player position. So I'm gonna go into on disable, and instead of setting all of these floats, I wanna set the position as some sort of a string. And to do that, I can use the JSON utility that's built in. So I use JSON utility dot to json 
and I can pass in my transform.position. Now this will return back a string, and that string is just gonna show the position as an X, Y, and Z value. So I'm gonna say var JSON equals that. And JSON is just, Java, again, JavaScript object notation was what it's short for. And I just named it that so that I remember that, hey, this is my string that's in that JavaScript notation or that JavaScript serialized version of it. A lot of the time I'll put JSON in the name of any field or local um, variable that I'm using that's got, that's in JSON format, just so that I remember what it is and I know exactly which object it is. All right, so now that I've got that there, I can just say player prefs dot, instead of set float, we'll do set string, string, there we go. And we'll change this to player position. And we'll set the value there, the JSON. Delete out those two lines with shift delete. And then we'll go down to our on enable and change that up too. So instead of looking for the player X value here, we'll see if we have a player position. And then if we do, we'll just load up our player position as a vector. So that will say JSON utility dot from JSON. And we have to give it the type, which is vector three. And we'll give it our JSON text. And the JSON text will get in our, from our player pref. So say our JSON equals player prefs dot not player player prefs dot get string, and then we give it our key again, which is that player position. I'll just copy that and paste it in, so I don't make any typos and mess something up. All right, now I'll copy this JSON here, and we're going to get that from our. So what we're going to do here, we've got the JSON text. We get it back from our player pref. This is going to give us that formatted text here. We're gonna pass it into the JSON utilities from JSON method. Let's just split up the lines here, make it really clear. And we're gonna pass that in as a parameter and we're gonna expect back a vector three. So we're gonna say, hey, here's this text, turn it back into a vector three. I need to do something with that. And what I wanna do with that is just assign it to the position. So I'll take that transform position equals and paste it right there. That should read the text, convert it to a vector and then assign it to my transform position. Let's save that off. Hit control shift B, let's see if it works. And then let's go through what the data actually looks like and how it works. So save, we hit play, we run in here. I don't expect it to load because I've changed all of those keys. If I run over here and I stop playing and I hit play again, I expect if I didn't mess anything up, yep, that we're back in the right position. So let's look at what that JSON data looks like real quick. And there are a couple different ways that we could do it. I'm gonna start by just attaching a debugger, hitting a breakpoint and showing it in there. And then maybe we'll show it in the inspector and then go through putting it into a file, saving it off you know, into the actual local file system instead of just in player prefs. All right, so now we're attached. I'm in writer, I just hit F5. It's kind of the same for Visual Studio and most editors, you just go in there and do whatever the attach hotkey is that you have. And then in my on disable, I'm gonna add a breakpoint right here. So right here on line 14, I've added a breakpoint. So when I disable this object or turn the game off, it should go into my save. I'm just gonna click the player to turn them off so that our breakpoint triggers and we go into the code. And here I can see the data of my JSON. This is another reason I like um, Writer. I know a lot of the editors are kind of catching up with this, but the little hints here, the, the tool tips that it's showing me are what the data of JSON actually looks like. So you can see it has squiggly braces and then quotation marks and X and some stuff. It's a little bit hard to read there still. But if I put my mouse over it, I can see it a little bit better. I can hit view here and get a little pop up. And this is the actual format. This is the JSON format with the X value, the Y value, and the Z. You see the Y is like 2.0. These are just floating point values. Um, because it's a floating point value, it's gonna give us a, a nice, really long number with way more detail than we need. We could change that off in our serialization. We don't really need to though. It's not worth our time. So we've got our position there and all that stuff saved off to JSON. We set it there and save it. I'm gonna go back to the on enable at a breakpoint here at F5. F5 just makes it continue. So if you hit a breakpoint, if you're debugging, you hit a breakpoint, um, you hit F5 again, once the editor or your code editor ha debugger has um, context or control, hit F5, it will continue on. That's the default, at least. You might have changed your hotkeys, you have to go back to it. But now if I go back over here and hit enable, enable this guy, so I click the button to turn the object on or click the checkbox to turn the game object on. Our on enable hits, we hit the breakpoint, and now we should be able to read that JSON back we get back that same exact text, and then this thing converts it back to a vector. That's it. That's all we need to do to save off or serialize off a simple single field, right? So we wanted to save off just the position there. Um, but if we wanna save off more data, things are gonna get more complicated because I can't just go like, hey, I wanna save, let's not save off just this player. Let's say I wanna save off, not, or not just this position. Let's say I wanna save the whole object, right? I'm like, oh, I wanna convert this thing. I wanna do a player instead. 
And I just passed in. Um, yep. Uh, well, that's actually, that's not going to work. I don't want to skip ahead too much. So, sorry, I think thinking out loud a little bit. But essentially, like, if I did this for just a single field or a single vector three, it's a small win, right? Like, I get a little bit of a bonus because I don't have to recreate that vector three. But really, in the reality, I don't want to do it for every single property on my object. I really want to save it for like my entire object, right? Like for my player or for um, whatever other thing. I want to be able to serialize that object out, save that that thing's data, and then reload that thing's data kind of independently. So that's what we'll do. I guess, yeah, let's do that next. We'll do that with our player. We'll go through the process of saving out the position and um, maybe something else. Maybe we'll save the. Let me think. Oh, I have an idea. Yeah, let's see. Let's try this out. So if we go into here and I'm going to stop debugging real quick, stop the Unity editor. What we're going to do is make it so that the player has some inertia so that it doesn't just stop automatically. So in the update method, we'll say if the velocity, if velocity dot magnitude is greater than zero, then we'll set the magnitude to it. So this way, if we let off the keyboard, the character should just kind of go and slow down on its own. So it's got a little bit of inertia. Let's try this out. Go back into Unity. We'll hit play. And then I expect to see him start going off to the side. There we go. And then he stops, right? So he goes off to the side and then stops. And goes off to the side and stops. But if I start going, um, here, let's set the speed up to like five. Let's say I start going to the right. Or let's go to the right and then I'll stop. Or I'll, I'll, let's disable him. That's that's good. That's the plan. So I'll go right, disable him, re-enable him, and okay, he's going. So what I want to do now is make it so that when he reloads, so if I go left, let's see, go left. Ah, I, my timing on this is terrible. Sorry. But if I go left and I stop and then I hit play again, I want him to continue moving. In fact, you know what the easiest way to do this would be? Is to just turn my character into a ball, right? Instead of making him a capsule, if I just, well, make him roll and stuff. Let's try that out. There we go. So if I let him roll, say I want to make him roll. Let's, let's do that. We're going to do that. We're going to turn this guy into a ball. He's no longer going to be a capsule. He's going to turn into a circle. So we'll go game object, 3D object. We'll make a sphere. This will be our sphere player. We'll reset his position, set his Y up to 2. Let's go grab him real quick, move him just over here. This is going to be our new player, our player that rolls around like a ball. We'll add a rigid body to him, and we'll just go disable this other player. In fact, let's go delete that other player completely and name this guy player. Now taken over, we've got a new player here. All right, we'll switch this over to continuous and then hit play. Our ball should now roll around. All right, so we got a ball there, and it just rolls in whatever direction we press. And then when I stop playing, it should save my position. I start playing again going to reload my position, but it doesn't reload my velocity. That's what I want to get. So let's get it over here. And we're going to make it start rolling up to the top. Just reproduce that one more time. So it's rolling up there. I stop playing. I start playing. It should reappear right here, saving our position, but the velocity is not saving. So let's go back in and figure out how we would change this code to save the velocity as well and to re-add our velocity to our player. And the easiest way to do it or the, the first version of what you might want to do is just go, hey, this is our JSON for saving the position. Let's copy it, paste it. We'll call this velocity JSON, and you'll see how quickly this is going to get messy, and then we'll fix it. But we'll name this velocity JSON, and then here we could say maybe we'll get the rigid body dot velocity. We'll serialize that out into another one, and we'll say this is the player velocity. It works. We'll copy this, and we'll go down here. Oh, actually, I guess we'll just copy and paste this line right here on in our on enable for getting the player position and setting the position. In fact, one thing we could do here, watch this. If I take this little line of code, cut it, and paste it right in here, and shrink this down into a single line. Now, I'm not sure I'm a giant fan of that, but when it comes to just reloading these parameters and properties like this, it's actually not too bad. If it's just a single thing like this where I'm just setting a bunch of parameters, if it was doing something more complicated or it wasn't gonna be doing the same thing over and over where I'm just mapping one to one, then I wouldn't like this format because it's way too long across the, the top for me. But for doing something like this, I'm, I'm okay with it. Now I'm going to duplicate this line and we'll say rigid body dot velocity is equal to player dot velocity. Save this off. I'm going to zoom that out just a little bit so everybody can see it all. 
he'll go back into unity hit play and now we should be saving off our velocity oh i spelled velocity wrong somebody caught it thank you let me fix it let me go back in there where did i spell yep e-l-o let's right click come on rider rename to velocity there you go thank you all right we'll do another build control shift b by the way is hotkey and rider to do a build hit play and then let's roll around so i'm going to roll to the right we'll stop playing start playing and look at that we continue to roll to the right so now we're saving off the position and the velocity you can see we're getting at least a couple different things here Oops, save and stop playing one more time i should see i'm rolling kind of out there to the side all right looking good so far i think we've got a couple things persisting but like i said this is going to eventually turn into a bit of a mess right because i'm going to want to save more and more things on these um <clears throat> oh man and i'm going to lose my voice too let me take a drink um in fact let's add another thing real quick let's add one more thing to the player before we really go about cleaning it because i feel like if i clean it too early the, the it doesn't really stick right like putting two things there and then shrinking that up and yeah, let's make another parameter here let's make something that we can pick up so i'm going to make it so that our little ball here can drive around and pick up um money but right, we'll make some little cubes that the the box or the player can grab let's go actually i wonder if there's something on the asset store that we could grab like some cash that can spin around oh, i'll just make some money let's that we'll make some money so we'll go game object 3d object make a cube we'll reset the position move it up here a bit and then hit f to zoom in i'm going to hit the r key to go into our scale mode and then shrink it down oh not that far shrink it down maybe like that and then like that and then like that, I don't know, something like that maybe. So I've got my nice little dollar bill there and then I'll go make a material for it. So I'll go to assets, right click, create a new folder. I'll call this art, my beautiful artwork. And then in here, we'll just make a new material and I'll probably just make this thing like bright green. Let's call this money. And let's just make it a big bright green to start and then attach it on here as our money. Let's go drop that onto my cube. There we go. Now I've got this cash right here. So I'll make some money that our player can go collect. And then we'll keep track of that showed in the UI, persist that off, and then see how we can refactor this to make persisting more and more things easier. All right, so we got our money here. Let's move it over to the side. Let's add a money script to it. So we'll go into the scripts folder. Actually, let's go into the player script. Let's go down to the bottom of it and just start typing. Say public class money mono behavior. May as well do it the way that I normally do it, right? So we'll zoom in a bit and then minimize that. And then we'll just move this money class to its own file. Now in my money, I want it to do two things. I want it to listen for a trigger enter so we can pick it up real quick, give the player some cash and give us something else to persist that changes. And then um, I guess eventually I want to persist whether or not the money has been picked up, but I also want to make the money spin around in a circle. So let's do that first. Let's start with an update and just say transform.rotate and we'll rotate on zero and then something on the Y, we'll call this rotation speed and then zero on the Z. I'm gonna generate a field for rotation speed. So just hit Alt Enter, generate a serialized field. Gotta love it. And then we'll set a value of, I'm gonna go with like five. Get rid of that private keyword that I don't need. Get rid of that private keyword that I don't need and turn that into an expression body method to shrink this whole thing down. Get rid of that system statement too. All right, now I've got money that spins in place. Should be able to hit play and just watch my money spin. Gives me time to take a drink while the money spins around and see what's going on in chat. If, if anybody, watching hasn't tried rider yet i definitely recommend just going and grabbing their trial it's it's worth a shot it's definitely worth trying but you have to um oh i didn't add the script let's add the money script you have to make sure that you're going to spend time with it though because it does take a lot of work um to get used to it obviously this is broken right um you have to get used to the hot keys changing and the way that things can move around but in my experience the benefit has been very worth it it's just been a nice easy to use one and it's given me a lot of really cool tips. So a couple things going on here. My money is spinning way too fast because I didn't add in time.delta time and I'm running at way too fast of a frame rate. And um, I didn't add the money script. So let's stop playing. Let's add the money script while I'm not in play mode. Go back into the script and multiply rotation speed by time.delta time. That should fix the issue there. It'll spin around. And then let's change it so that we can, oh, I'll handle our trigger. So we'll say on trigger enter. 
And then in here, we'll say if other dot get component player. Actually, you know what? Let's do a get component on it. Let's do this. We'll say if other dot try if other dot try get component. And then we'll do the component type of player and we say out var player. So if we get a player back from the other thing, then we'll get it right here as a variable. And what we want to do is tell the player to pick up the money. So we'll say player dot add money. I think that's good. And then we'll say what do we want to do game object dot set active to false for now. We'll just disable our object. We'll add some money to our player. Let's go to the player. The player will just say money plus plus. And then we'll update some money UI in just a moment. So let's add an exp oh no, not an expression body. Let's add a field for this. Okay, let's copy this and go up here and we'll just add a public property for it. Public int money. And it'll have a getter and a private setter. So now we've got a way to add money onto our player. Um, it's going to increment whenever we pick one up. And then the final thing I want to do is just slap a little bit of a UI real quick. All right, so let's go into UI development. We'll go add a UI under game object, UI and text mesh pro, import the TMP essentials. And then we'll set up a UI element. So I've got my text right here and then hit F and go to 2D mode and then we'll snap this up to the top. All right, there we go. And let's see if we can zoom out, zoom, zoom, zoom out. That should show our money. So I'm gonna start this off at zero dollars we'll make it nice and big um i don't know make it like 100 tall and then center it out this will show all of our cash all right let's go into um our money ui yeah so that i see a lot of people talking about um just serialization in general in general once you get as your serialization goes bigger and bigger and you'll see this as we go through this you can um we, we don't have to serialize as javascript that one of the things and I want to recommend this for everybody that's going through this too. If you do serialize your data out and you're saving your stuff out, so a little brief talk real quick in the middle of this. Um, a lot of time, the best way to do it and the, the way that I would recommend doing it in a large scale project is um, set up your serialization so that you can swap it so that it's adjustable. Generally, you don't want to save everything off in a human readable format. And JSON in general isn't the most optimized format. It's going to be much bigger, making it human readable and easy to read makes it much bigger. It's less efficient. It's obviously not encrypted or secure in any way, right? If people can get to the data, they can definitely change it. They can view it, they can modify it. But once, once you've built your system up, you really wanna be able to swap between the serialization modes ideally, because then when you run into issues, you can in debug mode, or at least in your local modes, swap over your serialization to JavaScript or JSON or something else, XML, something that is human readable so that you can go through that process and figure out what's going on and then just switch back to a binary or binary formatter or a, a binary serialization method or something that's encrypted um, afterwards. And that's that's generally the recommended way to go is having it um, so you can swap between both of those. We're going to start, we're starting with JavaScript right now because obviously it's by far the easiest and in 90% of the cases, it's probably going to be fine. But as soon as you need to actually save this encrypted, save it off so that people can't read it, you're going to want to add in that extra layer of being able to swap out the serializer. And that's really, really easy to do. So don't, don't worry about like, how do you do it? It's a very simple process to go through. Okay, let's go through uh, making our money actually show up. Now, I think in this case, I'm going to be lazy and just make this read directly from our player constantly and not set up an event. So I'm just going to call this UI money display. And I'm going to literally just bind it directly up to the player and just have it show the um, show the money on there. In fact, you know what? I might even do it worse. I'm going to go to the player. No, I'm going to do it on the. I'll, I'll do it on the money. I'll separate it out at least a little bit. So I say um, awake uh, player equals find object type. We'll just get the player here and cache it in awake. Uh, we we'll generate a field for that. Zoom this in a bunch here. Get rid of start. And then in our update, we'll just say um, our text will set to TMP text. So we'll say underscore text. We've got to cache it here. Equals get component uh, TMP underscore text. And then we'll generate a field for that, save that off. And then in our update, we'll just set the text. Set text, text dot, oh, I gotta add a using statement, sorry. So alt enter, add the using statements up here, which is gonna add that using TM pro statement. Let me get rid of these extra usings up here. 
and then here we'll say text dot ah dot set text and we'll set it to underscore player dot money in fact we're going to set it to dollar sign quotes dollar sign plus player dot money now this is definitely not optimized it's going to be spamming it and just resetting the text every frame doesn't matter at all because that's not what we're worried about i didn't want to set this up with an event and overcomplicate it and distract from the important stuff all right so now we've got our money display script there it's set up and it should show us how much money we've got so if i go over here rename my cube to money switch back into 3d mode and hit f i can get to my cache go place a couple of these out in fact let's turn this into a prefab first we'll go create a folder called prefabs and then we'll take our money drop it into the prefabs folder so it turns blue and I'll duplicate it and put a couple dollar bills out there. All right, hit play, and I should be able to now run over my money, and let's see if it works. I should, oh, and I'm gonna reset my player prefs because my player was flying off somewhere. Clear all player prefs, yes. All right, now I can go get my money. Oh, I can't get it because I didn't hit the is trigger. This is a good reason to make things into prefabs. I've got it as a prefab. Check is trigger, save. Try one more time. We'll go pick this up, get our cash. So we got one, we got two, we got three, and we got four, and then there's one more right here. We got five. All right, I'm gonna stop playing, and let's see what happens with our money. So I stop playing, I hit play again, and well, my position's reset, but so is all my money, right? I have no cash, and all of the dollars are reset back into where they were. Now I'm gonna go through the process of fixing that. So we'll make it so that our money actually will disappear. Well, first let's make it persist. Let's, let's do it a little buggy so that we save how much money we have and then we'll save the state of all the money that we've actually picked up. So we'll go through the process by going to our player and let's look at where we save. When we save right now in on disable, uh, we save off our player position and our player velocity. And then in on enable, we load both of those back in. Let's go through the next easy logical step of saving off our money. So if we wanted to save off our money, we might just go, well, player prefs dot set int, and we put in player money, and then put in our money value, right? So this will save it off as a separate integer. And then I can copy this, or go, what do I wanna do? Write down here, copy the get string. Ah, no, I'm gonna paste it right here. I'll say player prefs dot get int. So we'll change this from set int to get int. Go back here to change that S to a G and then paste the money right there. And now we're loading in our money. Obviously, when you talk about hacking, like this is by far the easiest way to make it hackable. Because if I do this and I, I've saved my money like this, right? I've just got it in this field. I could easily just jump into my um, registry. So if you've never used your registry, just type in reg, R-E-G or type reg edit and you'll get this little editor right here. Let's pop it up. Right here, if you're on Windows at least, you'll get an editor right here and you can just search in here. Um, you can actually find things by key. So I could go find and I could go search for my money key. I could search for player position and I could actually go find it as a key in here and then change it. I could change the value. I could do the same with money or whatever other thing that I want to go in and change. So that's why when people worry about like saving stuff off in serials or in JavaScript or saving stuff in player prefs, that's the reason. If you have important stuff, especially multiplayer stuff, don't just save it in raw text in player prefs because that's where you're gonna run into problems. Now, this does work though. Let, let's play and see how it works. Cause so say I've got a uh, mobile game, it's single player. I don't care about other people doing stuff or whatever. Um, I, I then I, I, I might not even need to go any further and this might be kind of good enough. Let's clear my prefs, hit play though and see if it actually works. All right, so I run around, I'll go get a dollar, I'll go get two dollars, I'm gonna stop playing, and then I'm gonna play again. And I've got two dollars, but all the money is reset. All right, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna make it so, well, what do I wanna, what do, I wanna do? Let me think about this for one second. Kinda want my velocity to stop, stop sticking around, but I guess it's okay. I'll, I'll just go from, from here. So I hit play again, remember, I get my two dollars, but the problem that I've got now is that my, other money is you know, already out there in the world. I can just go pick it up again. So I can go pick up this cash, go pick up this cash, go pick up this one and this one and this one, and I'll get up to $9. So I can stop playing, come back in. And then now I'm at $10 because I just ran over one. 
and so on. So you see that I'll just keep getting more and more money, right? So the, the cash that's in there right now, or the cash just keeps respawning, but it keeps track of the amount of money that I have. So we're gonna um, make some changes. We're going to make it so that our money saves off its, its position or its state. All of our money saves off its state. And we're gonna try to get this all into kind of a, a single object. So there are a couple of, couple things that I wanna do. First is let's make it so that the money can just save off its state on its own so that we can just write, write a simple script that'll find all of the objects that we wanna save their state and just save them off into something and then pull them back out. And then we'll make it so that we can serialize that into something even better and make yeah, just keep improving it. All right. Oh, it's getting warm in here. Sorry, the, the light's on bright, so it kind of blinds me and I get toasty. All right, let's go through this again. Um, we're gonna go into Unity. And what we wanna do is make something for our money so that our money can save off its state. And I really wanna make like a separate saving system. Instead of having my player do the saving, I wanna have a script that handles all of our saving for us so that it can save our player and save our money and save anything else that needs to be saved. So let's go into Rider here and let's just create a new script. In fact, I'm gonna go into the player script and I'm gonna take the stuff that saves the player data we're gonna move this into its own save system script, or let's call it a, um, let's call it game state. So we'll make a new class, public class game state, and we'll make that a mono behavior. And then, uh, no, let's call this game persist. It's not really state management, it's gonna be our persistence. And then in here, we're going to have a save method. So we'll do public void save. And then in the save, what I wanna do is save off all of the state for my player. So I wanna have my player save state, I wanna have my money save state and everything else. So I'm gonna first move this into its own file because I started coding it right in the middle of the player class, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'll move it down, paste it, and then click on it, hit alt enter and move it to its own file. And then what we'll do is on, let's add in the on disable here. So we'll do on disable, we'll do save, and then on enable, we'll do a load. Get rid of the private keywords, generate the load method, just kind of stubbing this all out real quick. And then we're going to start implementing it. So we'll turn that into an expression body, turn that into an expression body, get rid of that. And I don't think that this save method needs to be public. All right, so our persist is going to do two things. It's going to tell our player to save off its data or it's going to save off our player's data. And then it's also going to save off all of the other savable type of things data. So one way we can do this is to just add in an interface of savable or some persistence, like an I persist, I save data, I load data, something like that onto the components that we want to save data. So this is going to be like the, I would say the simplest way to do it that doesn't require you to really restructure your code very much. The other way that we're going to get into in a little bit, once we get a little bit more advanced, will be requiring us to really think about how we structure our data in our game. It's a lot more opinionated though, and it changes the way that your stuff works. So it might not work as well as just a slap in thing. This setup here should work relatively easily to just kind of work into your existing game. So this way this will work is we'll go through all of the things that can persist and then just tell them to persist. If we add in an interface, we can drop that onto all types of different objects that we want to persist and then tell them to handle their persistence on their own. Then we can move how we handle that persistence later. So we'll start with a simple save method. So in the save, we could do something like finding all of our savable objects. So we do like a find objects of type. Um, I persist, seems like a good name, P-E-R-S-I-S-T. And then we'll generate an interface for that. So we hit Alt, Enter, generate an I persist interface and add that in. In the I persist interface, we would probably have a save and a load. Oh, I need to add that void save and a void load. I think that, that seems good enough. Now we'll go through all of the objects that we find and then just tell them to save. So we'll say find object, not find object, find objects of type. And we'll change this into a for each loop. So for each var persist in find objects of type persist, we'll just say persist.save. Now this is obvious, oh, oh uh, what am I, no, I can do find object type. Sorry, so this isn't gonna work. I, I just, just mixing myself up here. So I don't, 
this was one of the things I wanted to show that we couldn't do. Let me go into my actual solution for it because I had it right up here. I got myself a little mixed up. We don't want to do the find object we wanted to. How did I persist these again? Oh, that's right. It, this I remember there was a simple. Now again, this is going to be the the less than optimal way to find all of them. I, I got myself mixed up on my less than optimal way, and it's to find all of the mono behaviors. So what we can do is find all of the objects that are in the scene, and then we want to include the inactive ones, and then we want to get them of type. There we go, and then use the I persist. And in fact, I think I want to rename this to I save state instead of I persist. That's right. And then we'll turn, there we go. So that's going to let us loop through all of the mono behaviors that implement I save state and then persist on them. So I got myself a little bit mixed up there. So this is again, getting all of the objects in the scene, including inactive ones that implement the I save state. So we're gonna loop through those and then just call save on these. Again, this is only happening at the end of our game, like when we're shutting down. So I'm not worried about speeding this up or anything. All right, then in our load, we can do kind of the same thing. We'll just go through our for each and just do a load instead. Just paste that in and we can load load our states and yeah, load our states and save our states. Sorry, getting myself a little bit mixed up. All right, now let's go into, um, so Zeke was asking about architecture cores. Now this is the much more simpler versions of, of stuff that will be in architecture at a much bigger level though. Um, what is an interface? Somebody was asking, Let, let's take a real quick brief talk about what an interface is. Uh, in this implementation right now, somebody was saying would give a nice freeze. This is literally only running at the uh, end of the game right now because we're going to find all these things. We definitely don't want to do a scan through a big project of all of the objects. We want to cache these out again. I want to make this so that you could just slap this in without restructuring and rebuilding your entire project. So this will let you add an interface on and then just find all of those things and save the stuff out. And then you can obviously continue on with the stuff that we'll get into later and make it even faster and cleaner. So what does an interface do real quick? Let's talk about it. An interface essentially assigns or defines a contract that a class or an object will adhere to. So if we say that something implements the I save state interface, we're just saying in this case that it will have a save method that takes no parameters and returns nothing. That's why it's got void here. And it'll have a load method that takes nothing and returns nothing. So if we have I save state on any class, we have to have those there. So this is going to find all of the classes that we have or all of the components or game objects that have something like a money script or any other script on them that has that interface added to the script. So let's go add it on and see what that actually looks like. Let's go to the money script and we'll hit comma after the mono behavior and to add an interface. That's how we do it after the base class or after the colon if we just are using object as our as our class. Um, we we put the interface that we want to, to implement, or the multiple interfaces that we want to implement. Implement. So we will use I save state here. We'll start typing it in, and immediately you should get an error and we get a little action option here saying that we need to implement the missing members. I can hit the button right there, and it'll just tell me what members it has that I need to implement and give me the option to check the ones that I want. I'm just going to leave them all and hit enter. And then I'll get my save and load method, but it gives me an exception here saying that it will blow up or that it's not not implemented yet. So it's going to essentially blow up or pause or give an error in my game. So I need to implement my save and load methods. So in the save and load methods, um, we can start off with the simplest way to save and load things, the least opinionated way before we get into serializing it. So say my money just wants to save its on and off state, right? I just want to save this off and I don't want to go into serializing that stuff. What I could do is as simple as doing a player prefs dot set pool, or let's do a set int and we could set our, let's say money and then our game object name plus, ah, I guess that's probably it. We don't even need an enabled and then just set it to one if we're enabled and two if we're, or zero if we're not. So we'll say game object dot enabled or is, what is it? game object that active self I get, get myself mixed up because we're setting it to not active. So if the game object is active, we'll set it to a one. Otherwise we'll set it to a zero. Pretty simple way to just lock in the object here or set a lock in the state, linking it directly to an, how am I saying that? I'm not getting my words out there, right? Let's try that again. So we call save, 
we get a string here that's money plus our name. So each one will have a unique name here and we'll set it to either true or false or one or zero based on whether or not we're active. And then we can do this inverse in our load and we just say player prefs dot get int money and then plus our game object dot name. And then we can set our object to that. So we'll say int is active equals that. So that's going to be a one or a zero. One would be true. And then we'll say if is active equals one game object dot set active true. Or even better, we just say game object dot set active is active equals one. Ah, I cannot get this auto complete to work. There we go. And tab that in. So this would, again, save this off just to player prefs. We're not serializing it yet, and we're not saving a lot of data on this object yet. But this will be an easy way to just make it so that any object can save, and you can kind of batch, save, and load things really, really easily. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into how we can do this across multiple game saves in just a moment, and then go into, I think, serialization after that. Kind of keep it kind of in a logical order so that it makes sense. Let's turn these into expression body methods real quick, or at least that save one into one. And then let's try it out. So I should be able to see my data save here, state and see them load. Let's see, am I missing anything? I think real quick, my save is called. It's called over here by this thing save and game persist toggles on enable and on disable. All right, I think that should work. Let's go try it out. So we'll hit play. What? Oh no, my, oh, my ball almost rolled away. All right, let's go get some cash. Got one, got two, got three. All right, we'll stop playing. We'll hit play again. And it did not work. So let's go see what happened. What did, oh, I know what, I know what happened. I didn't actually add the script. So this is what happens all the time. I, I, I say this all the time because it happens all the time. I write scripts and then I forget to add them to things. So I need to add my game persist script to an object. We'll go into Unity, we'll go create an empty game object. Call it game persist. I'm just gonna paste the class name right there, reset the transform position, and then add the component. Save that off and try again. All right, so now you see that when I hit play, all of my money disappeared, right? So the, what happened was when we loaded here, let's, in fact, let's disable the game persist. Let's hit play again and let's turn it on and see what happens. So here we're in, everything's fine. I load and bam, all my money disappeared. That's not because it's smart and it realized that I picked up my money a couple games ago. It's because our default value is actually invalid. Our default value when we load up a player pref is gonna be zero and we're using zero as what is active. So when we try to load it up, if the value isn't there, we get zero and we say the thing doesn't or isn't actually activated. So let's change that up a little bit. Let's go into our money and see how we would maybe modify this. So instead of saying that we want to set the active state of it, what I want to set instead is the picked up state of it. And I'm going to restructure the name of my key a little bit. In fact, I think I'll restructure the name of my key maybe in the awake. Oh, should I do an awake? Let's just do a property for it. So I'm going to take this little bit of code right here. I'm going to cut it and call this our um, save key. We'll generate a field for it. So alt enter generate a get only property. I said field, I meant property. And then I'm going to move this up which is just control alt shift and the up arrow to move a, a line up in writer, by the way. And I'm going to make this return back a string. So I do the expression body property there. And then we do dollar sign quotes to use string interpolation. This let me put variables in the middle and then I'm going to paste it in. Oh, I got extra quotes though. So let's just change this up a little bit. Let's get rid of that second quote. So we have money and then I don't need a quote here because I'm using string interpolation. We use the braces instead and put the variable in. So we use game object dot name. And we'll say picked up. So my key is going to be whether or not it was picked up. In fact, let's rename this to picked up key. So that it's very obvious what it is. So this is my key for whether or not it was picked up. So it was picked up will be true if it is not active. So if it's active self is false, it should be a one. And if it's not, then it should be a zero. That's right. That looks good, right? Wait, active self is, is true. Yep, so I got this inverted, so I'm gonna change this around. And then over here, we just change this around too. We'll invert those. Now, I didn't have to necessarily change the key. Oh, I do need to, however, make sure that the key matches. Um, I just wanted to clean that up a little bit because I don't like having all these string literals just 
kind of scattered throughout the code. I'm gonna put them in here, let's just put them in one spot. So that should allow me to now have a good default of the thing hasn't been picked up, but if it has been picked up, we'll turn the object off when we load. Let's try that out. All right, we hit play and we go around. And now if I load my game persist, you see that nothing blew up. I didn't lose all my money. If I go pick up some cash here and then disable it, I should expect to see my money. Well, nothing really changes, right? But I'll go stop playing. Let's hit play again. And then let's turn on the persist. And I should expect that those bits of money on the left fall away or disappear. That's looking good. I think that things are working. Let's try it with the game persist on. We'll save. I'm going to reset player prefs. Go to edit, clear all player prefs. Yes. We'll hit play. And then we'll go through and we should see that now our money saves, our position saves, and everything else just kind of saves. Obviously, we still want to restructure things and reformat it a bit. Um, but I want to get at least the very basics up and working. So I've got five. I'm going to leave those two and have the ball rolling towards me. We'll stop playing. We'll hit play one more time and see if the magic works. Nope, didn't work. So what happened? Let's take a look. Let's turn the persist off and on. What did I miss? I definitely missed something. Oh, I wonder if um, a registry pop up there. Let's see, what did I miss here? So we're picking up, we're saving, we're loading. Let's add a breakpoint and find out, you know? Let's go through the debugging process together real quick. So in Rider, we'll just add a breakpoint right here on the load. And what I'm gonna do is the easiest way when you're debugging this kind of stuff, just get rid of all the extras. Just have one thing in there. So I've got one bit of money in here. I'm gonna disable all the rest. We'll go to edit, clear all player prefs, hit yes, save, hit play, and we'll go pick that one up. Let's see what's actually happening there, why it wasn't working. So we go into, into Unity. Oh, we hit play. All right, so it loads and it's checking for that picked up key. Oh, see if money dash money was picked up, is active or was picked up should be false. So it should be active. That's true. Oh, I need to rename this variable. That's terrible. I've misnamed my variable. All right, let's go pick this up. And then we stop playing. And I should expect to see a save. Oh, no, did I add a breakpoint in my save? Let's go check. So in my save right here. Let's, there we go. We're going through. We're finding all of the things that persist. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't find my object. Okay, let's do it. Um, Let's save before we disable. This is the problem. The problem is I, I don't have buttons set up yet so that we can save and I'm just kind of saving when we're exiting right now. So let's add in a save and load button real quick. Let's make it so that we can just save and load without having to stop and start hitting play. First though, I'm gonna fix that variable name. So go back to our variable name. Where was that one? The one that I did not like. Where did you go? Bad variable is active. Was picked up. There we go. Now we'll go in and we're going to add in a button for loading a game and saving a game. In fact, we'll add in a button for loading and saving maybe three different games. So we can do load game one, load game two, load game three, save game one, save game two, save game three, and save off the state of all of those across. Things. So let's go into our UI again. We'll go to 2D mode, hit F, zoom out a ton, and then let's add in a panel. So right click on our canvas, UI, and add a panel. I'm gonna shrink this thing down. We'll center it real quick, make it maybe like a, 300 by 300, move it over here, fix up these anchors real quick. And then we'll zoom in on it and then add some buttons. So here we'll add a load button. Let's start with just a load and save button, a single one, and then we'll add two and three um, right after that or once we get the first one working. So add a button, this will be our load game one. And we'll call this load one or, or change the text, I mean, to say load one. So go in here load one, and then we'll make a save game one button too. So save game one, and we'll make this called, or make this text say save one. Oops, not, not with an extra line though. Ah, I changed that, save, there we go. Okay, I keep hitting escape, bad habit. All right, let's get these in position. So I'll put a save button up here, we'll put the load button up here, and uh, maybe shrink, resize these a little bit. I'm not gonna make them perfect because uh, nobody's gonna look at them again after this. You can always make your buttons perfect. All right, um, actually, I think I'm gonna leave that big so I've got lots of room. All right, so our load game button is going to just call the load method on that game persist. So I hit plus here in the on click. So I've got the button selected. Go down to the button component in the on click. We'll just add in the game persist object and the load method. So I'll go to game persist 
and look for load and oh it's not there and the reason it's not there is because it's not public so we'll go into our wait it is is it public no go into game persist it is not public we'll zoom out a bunch right here make this public save and we'll make our save method public too so this is going to let us save game one only right now and then maybe we'll make it take a parameter so we can save game two three four whatever else we want to do just off of a sing single button click all right so we'll go to our load button take our game persist again oh it's already assigned i already signed it i just need to go in the drop down game persist and choose load go to the save one same thing hit the plus add in a reference to game persists object so it can find the script go to game persist and choose what am i on save save there it is now i can save and load my game at runtime without having to enable and disable stuff at least should be able to let's go try it out um let's reset my fighter preps one more time the problem with this character just rolling around all the way or all the time by the way is that he just uh is really annoying because he just falls off so i'm going to go into our player script real quick and i'm just going to disable this line of code here that made it so that he kept velocity now he's just going to set his velocity to whatever it is um when i stop or when i hit the button to save which i think actually works well because now i can save it um and keep my velocity without having to hold the button down the whole time um, although it's going to reset my velocity every frame, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it doesn't matter. Okay, let's, um, where'd my player go? Stop playing. Let's clear player preps. I just don't want my player falling off the edge anymore. <laughs> All right, so we go grab our money. And we load one and the money reappears. So I load one and you see that it's not resetting my player's position. It's only resetting the money. Go pick it up, load one, it reappears. Go pick it up, load one, it reappears. I'm going to go pick it up. I'm going to hit save and then I'm going to hit load and it doesn't reappear. So far, so good. It's saving the money state, but it's not hooked up to the player state. So let's make the player implement that same interface so that it just kind of works with that game persistence setup that we have. To do that, we'll go over here to our money. We'll look at our interface, our I save state. Which file is this in? Let's hit F12 and go to it. Oops, Control Z, F12 to go to it. It's right now in the bottom of our game persist. I'm going to move it to its own file. Move to I save state. Then we'll go into player and we'll make it implement the I save state method. So just do comma, I save state, alt enter, implement those methods. In fact, right now I've got save and load. I'm not going to implement them. I'm going to hit escape. I'm going to go down here and where we have on disable, I'll make that save. And where we have on enable, I'll make that load. I do need to make them public so that they actually count for the interface because an interface essentially describes your public facing methods or your public contract. So if it's not public, you can't uh, access it. But changing on enable and on disable to save and load now should make it so that when I hit that button, uh, it saves my player too. So it'll save and load my player state. Let's try it out. All right. Oh, we have a compiler error. Let's go back into here. Control Shift B. I think it's saying that I have two I save states. Is that what it was? was let's go into Unity. Writer's not seeing it, so maybe there's an error here. Okay, it just hadn't caught up. Something, some got mixed up in the files. I'm just tab back and forth. Okay, so that seems good. I can move around. Let's stop playing. Let's reset player preps one more time. And then let's try loading and saving our state with everything. All right, so I'm moving around, moving around, moving around. Oh, whoops, I didn't save. Moving around, moving around. Let's go over here, save. And then I load and I'm back there. Okay, looking good. And if I go pick up my money, I've got $1, but if I load, I'm back at that spot with $0 and the money reappears. If I go pick up the money though, save, and then maybe run around here, load, I'm back there and I have my cash. All right, so let's go through the process of adding, I guess a little bit more money, because I think picking up $1 is kind of lame. And then um, yeah, go on to whatever, I forget what our next step was. There's quite a few different things that we can do here. So let's go into scene view, go to 2D mode, hit F, and let's just duplicate this cash a little bit. Put out a couple more dollars make sure that everything's working across um picking up multiple things and that saving and loading is right and then i think we'll do multiple save games and then combining data and uh maybe go into play fab and pushing stuff up into the cloud and all that stuff because right now um, we've got one way we got a way to save like a single game but not more than that oh our money spins so slowly look at that tiny tiny slow spin what's going on in the player too there's an error here saying that it couldn't get player velocity. Interesting. Wait, did it not get the, huh, I'm gonna hit load. Oh, let's just pit play again. I'm not sure what I messed up there. I'll fix the, 
We'll figure it out and get it debugged. All right, let's hit play though. Let's run around, grab some cash real quick. And grab just that half of the cash, save, and then load. Looking good, go pick up the rest of this cash. And then load, and yep, we're back to it. Now I wanna figure out what this error was real quick. So I'm gonna hit F5, added breakpoint right here in our load method, remove that other one. I'm gonna stop playing and hit play one more time just so we can see what's going on there. All right, oops, we're hitting the save method. Any second now, it should let me start again and we can load. The people are talking to in chat about saving data in databases. Going through, look at, look and see what everybody's chatting about in there. All right, so going through our load states. Okay, so here, what was null? Ah, the rigid body was null. Ah, okay, here's what happened. Let's talk about this. This is actually kind of an important thing. So if you're new to Unity, you may not have experienced this, or if it's like your first year in, you might run into this more often than not and just struggle and go, what the hell is wrong? Why did this stop working? Everything was fine, right? So what's going on here is we're loading and in it, in our load method, we're accessing the rigid body, right? And the rigid body, if you look here, is cached in our awake method. So our awake method gets our rigid body, but for some reason, when we call load, the rigid body is null. Let's hit F5 real quick. I'm gonna hit play in it, debug it, show it real quick, and then I'll show you how we can easily fix this. But I wanna show like how you can determine that this is the problem when this pops up, because this happens all the time. We'll hit play. We'll go back into Unity one more time, or back into Rider when it pops up any second now. And you can just put our mouse right over here and you can see that the rigid body is null. So I knew that the error was on this line because the error message said it's on line 29. But theoretically, like, actually, realistically, there wasn't much that could be null. So I, I guess, like, rigid body was kind of the only thing. But if you're not sure, you add a breakpoint and you can just mouse over things and start looking at stuff. So I could look at, like, the results of this, but it, none of, nothing else could really be the option. So let's go see why that's happening. Because it's getting cached here in awake. But the problem is that this load method is getting called before awake. Now, if you're new to Unity, you're thinking, like, how the hell is something getting called before awake? It's because all of the awakes are called together. So if we go in here, like, well, let's go into game persist, right? So here we've got a situation where if you look at the game execution order stuff, right? You see that awake gets called, then on enable, and then start, which is kind of weird. Like you might think on enable gets called after start, but it's awake, on enable, start, and then all of the other methods, and then the things that get called every frame. But what happens when you call awake on on enable is that they're called on each object at once. So the player will call it's awake and then it's on enable. The game persist will call it's awake and then call it's on enable and everything else will do the same thing. And then all of them will call their start methods. Now what happens here is because of just sheer luck and the order that the things were added into the scene and the system that I'm on, the game persists awake and on enable are calling before the players awake and on enable. So what happens is this calls in, it calls the load before players cache that rigid body. We get a null reference exception, the game blows up and we don't know why. And this again, won't happen all the time, right? Like I could run this again on a Mac and it might work totally fine because the execution order has changed. There are two ways to fix this really. One is, there is an ability to go in and kind of hard code the script execution order. So you could change it so that that one that the player always runs before the, the game persists. That's an option. Not the one that I would usually recommend though. There, I didn't lie, there are three options. Because another option is to set up the binding and control of all of this stuff in a single place. So you have like a single script that kind of bootstraps your game and sets up all of these references and kind of handles that. That's what like a dependency injection framework would do. The third option is to just change our game persist to not do this in on enable and to do this in start instead. and then maybe we could still leave this in on disable but we really we don't even need it in start we could probably just disable it and take over control of it but if we move it to start then it will at least fix the issue we won't get that no reference exception in our work i'm going to just disable them though because i want to now load in every time fresh with a new game and then just have the ability to save and load an existing saved game so I want to be able to go through a bunch of different saves. And I think that that functionality of auto loading the last one makes it a little bit harder for me to play with that. Let's try it out again one more time. No more error. Look, that error is gone. Go pick up some money. 
I go hit load one and I'm back at whatever load one was, but I can hit play and go back and reset. All right, so now we've got a system that allows us to kind of save out at least a variety of different things. So we're saving the player's position, the player's velocity, uh, the player's money, and then the money is also saving its own state. And the money could save more than just the data that it's got there. If we look right now, let's hit play again and let's watch what the money does. We hit play, come on. Oh, I think I might've hit a breakpoint. Nope, no breakpoint. So see like when I restart and I hit load, the money doesn't reset to its original rotation, right? It just keeps spinning at the rotation that it was at. So one option that I could have is like go into our money. And if I wanted to make the money you know, save its rotation, I could just implement that right here in the save and in the load. I could extend it out so that this money object saved whatever extra data that I want, not just its active state. It could save like how many times it's been hit, what its current health is, whatever other type of data that I want. Just like in the player, I can save off you know, this other data that I've got here. In the money, I can save off whatever I wanted as well. All right, let's go through saving multiple games now because I think that's where it gets a little bit more interesting. So we'll go through the process of adding a couple buttons here and we're gonna hook up the buttons so that they can save like game one, game two, and game three. Did money stop saving? Let me hit play. Let me said money stopped saving. I want to make sure that's not actually true and I didn't break it. Possible that I made it look that way. It's possible that I also broke it too. So I loaded. Oh no, my money is not interesting. Let's try this again. So let's go through play. I'm going to save it and see if my money is saved. Maybe I did break it and then we'll go through the process of debugging that and fix it real quick. So we'll go grab some cash. One, two, three dollars. Save them and load. And when I load, it seems okay. Let's stop playing and play again. Oh, is it, well, when I removed auto load. Ah, okay. So I think what happened there when the money got set out to zero was that um, I removed the loading but enabled the saving. So I had reset it to save it and cleared it out, but I'm not 100% sure. I guess I'll find out soon. Oh, hey, thanks for the super chat, Cybercoder. All right, let's go through and add in our new buttons. So we'll go, we want to load game one, load game two, and then I want to load game three and four. So I'm going to go into 2D mode, hit F, and we're just going to take these buttons here and duplicate them. So take load game one and two, collapse these down, control D, W, and move them down a bit, control D, move them down a bit, and then let's start renaming them. So this will be save game two, load game two, save game three, load game three. Are those in the right positions? Nope. Um, let's rename those. Let's move these up here. So these are two, two, and three and three and i want to get these in the same order so they're load save load save load save all right now i want to change the text on them real quick i could of course automate this but i don't think it's worth automating because take me more time to write the code than it will to write the text here and we'll change these ones to say three as well then we just have to hook these buttons up so that they actually pass in what game we want to load and save there we go i've got my save and load buttons and remember these are hooked up to our let's go to the button itself they're hooked up to the game persists save method and the game persists load method. So if I go to game persist here, open it up, what I can do is make it so that my load and save methods just take a game number or a game name. So I could say something like int game number and then do the same for my save. Let's save that off and go into Unity. And then I'll see these as parameters. I can just pass this in and then save off a game by simply, well, you'll see how easy it is. We can just add some text to our keys and save that off. And then you'll see it gets even easier once we stream everything or serialize everything. Sorry, reading chat and everything at the same time as uh, as typing code gets a little bit weird. All right, so we'll go in here. We've got load game one. I'm going to go to my button here and I've got a load method. So I'll go to game persist and choose load here, which now takes an int. It was missing before because that method, um, well, it's changed. It's changed to a new method that requires an int. So the first one will load game one, and then we'll do save game one. So game persist, save, and it'll save game one. Of course, how you set up your buttons and your UI for this will totally depend on your actual game. Like do it how whatever way makes the most sense. I'm gonna choose game persist here. Oh, see, I want load and load. I'm gonna select it on both of them and then do the um numbers in them individually. So two and three, and then you do the same for the saves. So go set up that reference. Go choose save and we'll choose, I put in three here and then I click on this one and put in two and I've got them all set up. 
All right, so now I can save and load games one, two, and three, or at least I have buttons that do it and they say it to the method, but it doesn't actually do the thing. So let's make it so that we can actually save the game number now. Now, easiest thing to do, or the easiest way to extend this is just to pass in the game number to these methods. I can make my save and load methods take a game number, do int game number in my interface, and then if I do control shift B, it's, oh, I need to stop running and debugging, but it should give me back a list of the errors that I've got. And the errors are going to be because I've changed the, the um, implementation or the method structure of uh, my save and load. So, or oh, I changed the implementation that I need in the interface and I haven't done it in the method yet. So it says that they no longer implement the method. Well, it says that they don't, not no longer because it doesn't know the historical fact that it used to. But it's easy for us to fix. All we have to do is change the structure. Now I could hit Alt Enter and hit Implement Missing Methods and then have it just add them in. And it gives me a save and a load with those two parameters. But I already know what I need. I need this int game number just added as a parameter. So I'm just going to cut it. Let's take it right there. Control X, get it on my clipboard. I'm going to delete this stuff out. And then we'll just go paste this in as parameters for load and save. Control Shift B. You should see that those errors are gone. Oh, why am I still debugging? I thought it'd stop that. Those ones are gone, but now this one in money has the same problem. So we'll just go add those two parameters and save that off. And then now my errors are gone, but it doesn't actually save anything specific to the number. So if I try it out, let's go try it real quick and see what it does. I've added buttons, I've hooked them up, I passed in the parameter, but if I go like load two, you see it still looks like my load one, my load one, two, and three. If I go over here and pick up more money, Let's go pick up some cash. I'm gonna go pick up three more dollars somewhere. And I hit save three and then I load one. Well, you see, I'm still at the same one. And here I'm at the same one because when we save and load right now, we're not actually saving them off to separate games. We're just passing that in as a parameter. So let's make the parameter actually do something. In our money, it's pretty easy to do. We just need to change our key. So we'll make our picked up key something like game number plus picked up key. Now, how we set these keys up and link them totally depends on your game and your project. Obviously, this is not the prettiest key format, but eventually we'll switch to a JavaScript one. So I don't want to give you some specific format for how you should set up all of your keys. Pick however you want to set them up. But just having the game number in there or the game's key or the game's name or something is enough to separate them out so that we can load up the one that we want and save the one that we want. Then I can go into my player and do the same. So here I can just do game number plus. And I'm just going to paste this in front of all of these for now. Paste, paste, and paste, and save. And now I've got it saving off of three different game numbers. Let's try it out. All right, so run around, grab $1. I'll save that as game one. I'm going to go grab two more dollars. Save that as game two. And then I'm gonna go grab a couple more and save that as game three. Now let's load game two. Load game one. Load game three. One, two, three, one, two, three. So you can see how easy it is to, to just make this work, right? It's actually just working now. We're loading things for different games um, just literally by appending a key. Um, oh, somebody's talking about versioning saves. Uh, let's let's uh talk. Oh. Let's take a brief pause for a second. So, one of the issues with this setup, um, and one of the things mentioned in chat is that if we start to add in new versions of our game and we start to upgrade things and change things dramatically, um, our save data could become out of sync, right? If we start to rename our game objects, um and we start to add new things and change stuff, our, our data could come out of sync pretty easily and getting it so that it matches up with an, like our newer version of a game matches up with an older save is, um, well, it's kind of a, a pain, right? Like it, it requires work and some forethought. I would say it's a pain, but I mean, it's not something that's just automatic and that you're just gonna get kind of for free. What you need to do in those cases are well, two different things. The first is you do want to keep track of the actual version number of your save. So I think back to when we'd save like large character data for um, an MMO. It would save off all of this data. And essentially, 
you'd be surprised, but it's essentially a very similar system. We're serializing off the data. So you take all of the important data of the character, um, kind of like what we have on the player, not so much the money side, that, that part would go in a different spot. We take all of the important data of the player, the inventory, their quest status, um, all of their stuff that they've done, every like achievement that they've ever done, take that data, serialize it down, and then um, kind of stamp that with a version number. So whenever the game would rev to a point where the what you generally do is when the game is changing enough to the point where a old save would cause an issue and needs an upgrade to work in the new loading system, you'd write a simple little upgrade process that would upgrade that data. So it would take the data from the previous save, and if there was any transformation that needed to be done to it, would do that transformation to the data in that in the process or in the game while loading it and then resave the data out in the latest format or the latest version of the game automatically. All right. So that's um just a real quick note on versioning because you do need to think about it um as your game updates. You need to make sure that you're thinking about you know, can I can I do an upgrade to this? If I do an update, what breaks, what changes and how can I make it adapt so that it's not an issue. And somebody's also asking if this would work well with the binary formatter. And yeah, that's one of the things I was uh briefly talking about earlier was that when you set the system up, when you set it up to do the serialization, which is where we're going next, um, excuse me, we've already done a little bit of it, but once we start it up, start doing full serialization of stuff, <laughs> burping on the camera, right? Um, then what, what you can do is just swap out the serializer. So you can swap to a JSON serializer or a binary one, use the binary formatter or whatever else you want to persist that data out. All right, so let's go on to, um, the next bit of stuff that I want to do, which is saving this all off into just one big single JavaScript file so that we can then send it off to the cloud and maybe save it in a cloud save somewhere else as just a single bit of data that we could do whatever we want with. So to do that, we need to, well, start thinking about how we want to actually save our data and come up with a simple data saving or game saving data structure. Right now, we're just kind of ad hoc saving a bunch of stuff. So our money saves its own stuff, our player saves its own stuff, and the game persist method just, or the game persist class or mono behavior, the object here, is really just saying, hey, all of you things go do your own stuff. Now I wanna make it so that instead of that, they'll just, well, let the game persist do the serialization itself. So get the data from the object and then have it serialize and deserialize back out. So I can just kind of pass the data into the thing and then, um, uh, and then get it back. So that, that's that's the plan, and that's that's where we're gonna go with it. So we'll go through, and I'm gonna delete out these two unused things. We're gonna create a new class, and I'm gonna call this game data. So say public class game data, and in it I'm gonna store off all of the stuff that I want to save. So some of the things that I want to save: uh, money. That's my my current amount of money. I'm gonna make these uh, public. So it's gonna be some public integer for my money. I'm gonna make a public vector three for my player position. Uh, I'll make a public vector three for my player velocity. And again, these are just the parameters that I came up with as simple ones to demonstrate. You can use whatever things you need to save. If you gotta save all kinds of other crazy stuff, you can just add them in as parameters as long as they're serializable. Which reminds me, we need to add the serializable attribute here. Add that serializable attribute at the top of our game data. And then um, let's see, what else do we want to add in? We want to add in our money data. So I want to save the state of all of my money objects. So I'm going to create another class called money data. And then this will just store off all of my money objects current state. So I'll say public string name and public bool bool, not billboard asset, bool, um, is picked up. So those are the two parameters that I have on my money. Right now on my money, let's go take a look at it again. Really all I save is whether or not it was picked up. Or let's rename this to was, that is, so that it matches. And then I also just need my name so that I've got some sort of a key to link it back to the specific money object. I'm going to make this serializable as well. And then we'll make that a list of money datas in our game data. And we'll call this money datas. Ah, I cannot spell today. Capitalize that and make it public. And we'll even make it a new list of money datas. 
All right, there we go. We've got two data classes that we can start to use. Um, money rotation, yeah, that's something we, maybe we'll add that to. Let's, let's, let's do it. Let's say float, uh, public float, y. This would just be our y value, our y Euler angles value. So we can change that around and make it spin. All right, so let's move these into their own files. Move game data into its own file and move money data into, actually I think I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna move it to its own file. Thought about moving it into the game data file, but I think I wanna leave it in the, in its own file. All right, we'll go back into game persist. And then in our save, what we're gonna do is set up a game data. We'll create a game data object and we'll just persist that thing out. All right, so where are we at? I lost my place. I hate uh, reading chat always gets me mixed up. <laughs> All right, so in our save, we're gonna create our game data here. So we'll say game data underscore game data equals new game data. We'll just give it a new default value. And then in our save, we'll say, we wanna serialize it. So we'll say var JSON equals JSON utility dot to JSON and we'll, serialize out our JSON. And then here we'll do a player prefs and we'll just write that out. So say player prefs dot set string. And let's call this game data and we'll call it game data for our game number. So game data plus game number and we'll set the value to our JSON. So the goal here now is to take it so that all of the stuff that we're saving out in all of those different player prefs keys and all of those different sections and we're gonna get them all into this game data object and then we're going to save that object out because then what we can do is just take this. We can take this little string here. We can send it off to a web service or a cloud service or whatever other thing. We can write it into whatever object we want. Just keep it in one spot. It's, our, it's basically our save game. We don't want to have a save game that's necessarily a ton of different fields saved in a bunch of spots. We're just getting a save game that's from, well, it's one big save game file, right? We can save it as a save game dot dat or whatever you want to call it um, and get it all in that one place. So we've got it here, we're setting it and we're saving it. Um, not super useful yet though, because we're not really filling that object out, right? We need to actually make this game data object have the actual data that we want it to have. So let's do that now. What we can do is say in our save, instead of going through and persisting all of these, in fact, I'm leaving that there so that we can see it, but we're gonna kind of skip past the, the saving. What we're going to do is get that data, but oh. let me give me let me give it a thought. <laughs> All right, let me give a thought straight real quick. And my words right. Take a drink, and then we'll write the code. Ah, getting all mixed up. Okay, so I want to get my player's position into our game data. So say game data dot player position equals player dot transform dot position. I don't have my player, so I'm just gonna get it. I'll say var player equals find object type player. Um, in fact, I think I should cache that and save that off somewhere. But for now, I'm just gonna grab it, put it into this player and in, into here so that I can save off the player position. And then we had a player velocity. And then I could get the velocity data from it too. What we're gonna do, that, so with the player, we're gonna do it a little bit different. With all the other objects, we're gonna actually use the interface to get the data back from them. But with the player, I'm gonna do kind of a weird mix of stuff, so I don't think I wanna go that route. So we'll say get component, we'll just get the rigid body, and we'll get the velocity. All right, so we've got those two. There was one other field, right? Oh, our money. So the final field that we'll do is our money. The player, or let's do that first, because it's the most important, right? Our money is equal to our player dot money. So this is gonna let us save off our player's data here. And at least it should give us our player save data into our game data here. Let's, um, oh, you know what I should have done? Let, let's change this up a little bit. Let's clean this more. Cause the, the way that, um, you know, let, let's make it work and then we'll clean it more. So we're gonna keep improving it, right? We're gonna, we need to get to a player data object because that's where this should be. The other thing that we need to do once we've got, we've got all this player data going into our game data so we can serialize it is get all of our other objects, our money objects in there persisting. But I think I'm gonna load the player data first. No, I'm gonna save the, I'm gonna save the money data, let's do it. So in our saving the money data, what we wanna do is create a new money data object. Let's go to our money data script here. 
And this is essentially just an object that's got the name, the state of it, and the Y position. It's going to be saved off in a list on our game data. So let's go back to our game persist. And for each one of these objects that has data that can save, we're going to All right, reading chat too. I, I got to stop reading chat while I'm in here. So what we're going to do is take the data that we need here and get it, get back a money data object. And then we're just going to add it into our game data. So say game data dot money data dot add, and we're going to get back the money data, but I don't want to go through all of the, um, I save state objects here. I think what I want to do is just go through the money objects here and persist those out instead. So we're going to do that. We're going to just going to go through money objects because there's there's more that we can do here to abstract it out. But I feel like if I abstract it without having another explanation there or example, it feel, it's going to overcomplicate it and make it a little bit too confusing and not make as much sense. So I'm going to just take the persist here, which is let's rename this to money. And then we'll go we'll take our money dot data. And we're just going to add the data from our money object into our money data object. Now we're going to generate a money data. So we'll go in here, create a get only property here. And this is going to have a private setter and a public getter. And what we're going to do is move down the state of this into this money data object. Or we could just um, return back out a new money data object based on the state of it. So let's let's do that. Let's start with um, Let's start with just returning back. Oh, I'm trying to think if I want to if I want to go through the process of setting the state of it. Yeah, let's do that. So in here, let's see. What we'll do is when we pick it up, we'll say data dot was picked up equals true. And then in our update method, we're going to expand this out. We're going to say data dot y equals transform dot rotation dot Euler angles dot y. So then we're going to cache the y every frame right now into that data object. And we're going to cache in our state of it whenever we pick it up. I think the y caching we could probably just do on a save. But for now, I just want to add it in the update because theoretically, we can put whatever type of stuff is going to change every frame we might want to put in there and pass that down into the data right now. It's just the y position rotating. But I think that um, we, we could put any type of thing in there. So we've got our positions going in, our data is getting updated. Um, we want to set this to a new money data and it should not be getting reset. So add a semicolon there. Let's see, do we need anything else? Nope. Okay, so in our save method, what do we want to do? Oh, right, pretty much nothing, right? Because no longer do I need to actually save stuff. I just need to actually to get the data back or return the data back from our money data and have my game persist method save it instead. So maybe the save method can go away. In fact, that's what we're going to do pretty soon. We're going to remove this from our interface. But what about our load method? Our load method needs to actually be able to load in some data, maybe from a money data object instead of from a game number, because I don't want this to pull data in from the um, from the player prefs or read data or do any serialization. I want it to take that data object and then set its state based on that data object. So instead of taking a game number in here, let's make it load off of a money data. And then in here, what we'll do is say our money data equals money data. Oh, I, there we go. Our underscore money data or our, our local, let me get my words right, comment this out. Our instance of money data on this class, the one that had a private setter, where is it? Wait, do I have it on here? Oh, I named it data. That's why I got myself confused. We're going to rename this money data. All right, that's what happens when I change my naming schemes up. The money data, money data. So our money data is going to be set to the one that we pass in. So what we're essentially doing is saying, hey, when we load this, take this data object that was serialized out from before, pass that in, use that as your new object. The last thing that we need to do is just set our active state based on that money data's active state and set our rotation based on it. So I'll take this line, move it up right here. We'll set it to active based on our money data, the uppercase one. It, really, they're both the same object, so it doesn't matter. But we want to do it based on the was picked up. And we want the inverse of that. So not was picked up. So 
it would be active if it wasn't picked up, this deactive if it wasn't. And then the other thing we want to do is set our rotation. So we say transform dot local rotation. No, transform dot rotation equals quaternion dot Euler, and we'll pass in zero comma zero. Oh, zero comma money data dot y. There we go. Get them right, and then zero. So that's going to restore our rotations. Now we're restoring our rotation, and our save method doesn't really need to do anything. In fact, I can get rid of this interface completely here because our money is now kind of saving in its, on its own um, in its own way. Again, we could add an interface that saves off of something a little bit more generic when we have data that's going to save this persistent, like we have pickable, pick upable objects could be an interface instead of money data, could just be objects that are liftable or pick upable or grabable or whatever you want to call the interface for it. We don't necessarily have to reference the money data class, but it does need to be a little bit more specific in the type of data that it's serializing. Or we could make it an I serialized data or an I save data that takes in a type and use some generic types. I don't want to get into that yet because I feel like if I get into generics with interfaces, I'm going to overcomplicate it for a lot of people who are already kind of struggling to follow along. But if you're comfortable with interfaces, you could definitely have an I save state of type money data and then implement that and then have that as your interface as well. So let's go through fixing up our interface implementation or our calls to it. Do we need to do anything for that? Let's go take a look. In our game persist, right now we're just looping through all of the monies and saving those. That seems good. And then in our load, we just need to do the same. So we're going to change this from looping through mono behaviors to looping through money. We're going to get including the active ones. And then in all of them, what do we want to do? Well, we, we load them. We just want to say, oh, let's rename this to money. We want money dot load and we want it to load our game money data so we'll say money data now we need to get that money data out right so let's take a look at it real quick we save our money data by adding them all into this money data's object right and then we serialize that out so when i deserialize it i should expect to get back another list of money datas and then i can just go through that list of money datas link them up to the objects and then reset the data so let's try it out when I do to do that, I'm going to need to load my let's zoom out. So I'm not scrolling up and down here. I'm going to need to load my data from this game data or from this string right here into a game data object and then loop through them. So we'll say bar game data or underscore game data equals JSON utility dot from JSON type game data. And then we need the string in here. We'll just put in the word JSON and we'll make a string for that. We'll create a local variable string JSON equals, let's zoom in a bit so you can see it again. It's going to be equal to player prefs dot get string. And then we'll load our string right here, game data plus game number. And again, we don't have to read this from player prefs. We could read this from a file, from a remote data store or whatever else we want. It doesn't matter. Player prefs is just the easiest that works everywhere. Um, the downsides to player prefs are pretty well known. If you don't know about them, you should look them up. Biggest ones are like size limitations and easy accessibility. But right now we're just going to save them into there because it doesn't really matter. The process is exactly the same. So we've got our JSON text there. We're going to deserialize it into a game data object. And then we're going to loop through all of our money objects here. And see if we have a game data object that matches that or a money data object that matches for that game data. So we'll say bar money data equals game data dot money datas dot first or default and we're just going to use a link statement here if we had a ton of things this would be i would say less than efficient we might want to profile it but for this case it's not going to matter at all so if you're worried about link just remember you can profile it and fix it if you need to but in our case i don't think it's going to matter so we're going to do a link statement where we're going to find the first one whose name matches our money's name so here we're comparing the money data object's name to the game object money's name. We're going to find the first one that matches so that we find the matching one that just keyed off of the names. And then we're going to tell that money object, this is the actual game object, to load the data from it. Let's go take a look at that real quick one more time, that name field right here. That's this one. One thing you might have noticed though, if you've been following along, I didn't set the name on our money data when we save it. So if we go down into our save here and we look at our money.money .money data, so we go, let's, let's go look at it. Right here, this money data object that gets created, it never actually gets its data um, saved. So it never gets, or it never gets its name saved off to match. So what I need to do is make sure that in our awake or sometime in our process or in our lifetime, 
we make the money data's name match our name. Now we could do that um, in our start method. We could do it in our load method. We could do it even in a save method. What I'm going to do is add it into our start. So I'll add a private start, and I'll just say money data dot name equals game object dot name. And I'm going to turn that just in an expression body method. And I'm going to copy that and I'm going to put that into our load method as well. Because, well, I don't need to do it in our load method because it's only going to load if they match. So I don't need to. Okay, I think we're good there. We can go back. Let's see. Save everything off. I think if I do a build and hit play, we should be good to go. And we should be saving and loading multiple games um, all into this one file. Give it a go. I'm probably going to run into an error or two, is my guess, though. Coding things live, that tends to happen. All right, so run over here. We'll go grab one money, two monies. Hit the save button. No errors occurred yet. Okay, we'll go back over here. Hit load. Okay, my money reappeared. My money reloaded. And it's reloading in its positions. So that's good. Um, My, my player's not reloading. But my money is reloading in its positions. Let's go grab some more money. Save game two and see if it keeps my other positions. Save game two. So I load one. They're in that position. Load two. Hey. So my money and uh and that stuff is working great. The only issue now is that my player is not persisting properly. So let's make the player persist properly. Oh, the reason he's not persisting he is he just doesn't load properly. So the game data right here is getting saved off and setting the player's position and velocity. We don't actually reload them in the load method though. So let's go through that process real quick. Take these right here. Just these little couple lines. Actually, let's cache the player here. So I'm going to take this line right here, the game persist one, and I'm going to cache this player off in our await. Because I'm going to reference it again somewhere. So add a underscore player, generate a field for it, and then turn this into an expression body method. Oh, go down here, expression body, get rid of the private keywords. I'm going to get rid of all these private keywords too. Because I don't, ah, the wrong hotkey. Just because I don't need them and I like to shrink things up a little bit. All right, so now we've got our player saved off. And then in here, we'll save the player's money, the position, and velocity into the game data. And then we'll load those back in in our load method now that I've cached it. So we'll go up here. After we load all of the money data, we'll just say player.transform.position equals game data.player position. And then we copy and do the same for our rigid body. Get component rigid body. Now I think in in a, again in an ideal situation you don't want to be grabbing the rigid body component. You probably want to be setting something on the player, and that's I think what we'll do next. Maybe we'll pass in a player data, pass that into the player, let that thing load, and then we'll go into some remote saving and loading. So we'll do player dot money equals game data dot money. All right, so save that off. Control Shift B. And oh yeah, you can see we've already got an error here. And the error, if I hit F12, is that money is privately settable. It's not supposed to be set from outside the player class, mostly to prevent accidental misuse of it. And now this change that I've made kind of exposes or requires me to open up my player and make it ugly and make it bad. I don't like it. I'm gonna do it anyway just for a second and then we're gonna go back and change it. So we'll change it, we'll make it public by removing the private keyword around that money setter. We'll go into Unity, make sure that it works, and then we'll go back to setting it private and see how we can kind of clean that back up a little bit more. All right, so we stop playing, play again. All right, we'll run around, grab one money, two money, save. Grab three money, four money, save. And we'll grab five monies and save. Load one, load two, load three. I think it's looking good. It's saving off our data now into this one file. Let's go take a look at what that file looks like or what that JSON data looks like. So I'm going to hit F5 in here. And then the save method actually isn't even getting called anymore. So I could probably get rid of that. Let's go into our game persist though. And let's take a look at what the data actually looks like when we save it off. So right here is at the end of our save right after we've converted the data over to JSON. And I'll hit save. And if we look at it right here, let's just click on it and get it up here in an editor. Move my mouse over very slowly. I'm going to copy this onto the clipboard. We're just going to take a quick peek at what this data looks like. 
Okay, so there we go. Got the data on there. Um, let's zoom this out. Ah, okay. Let's let's find a JSON formatter real quick. In two seconds. I'm gonna paste this into like a JSON formatter online real quick, so you can see what it looks what it looks like kind of in a neater format. All right, here we go. A JSON formatter and validator. Oh, that didn't work. Full screen is way too big. Um, but essentially, the the way that it works or the way that th this file is set up, kind of see it here, is that we've got our root level object, and that's what this opening brace is. So when you're looking at your JSON data and you're trying to figure out what it is, what I usually recommend is copy it into something that will format it well. Um, Writer can do it, other editors can do it. This tool has, um, uh, this is just like a little web page that'll let you paste it into. There's tons of different ways to do it. I just wanted to show that like you don't have to use Writer to do it or anything else. You can use whatever you find you whatever you can find to see your data and actually view it. But what it actually looks like is you'll get this object and you can kind of collapse them down. And underneath it, it'll have a key and a value for everything on the object. If we go look at our actual data object here, let's go look at the game data object. You see that it's got money, player position, player velocity, and money data. And that's what we see here. We have money, player position, player velocity, and money data, all in that order. So these are the fields that we have on that object. Player position expands out because it's an object and it has its own field. So that has the X, Y, and Z, same for the velocity. And then money data, because it's an array, has these little square braces around it. So all of the data inside money data is gonna be in those square braces, meaning this is an array or a collection of things. Um, and then these are the actual objects or the entries of the objects in there. So this is a way to just view the data, see what it looks like, and see what your actual save stuff is showing. And here you'll see that actually we've got an issue. If we look at this, but right, we've got a lot of money objects here. Um, and we've got multiple, right? So if I look here, I've got money six. I think I've got a money one. I saw money six, money one, money one, money six. So what, what's happening? What's causing this? Well, if you think about it for a moment, money data is a list of things, right? It's a list of data objects. And when we save, let's go to the code where we save. Right here, we add to this list. Now, when we create money data, we're loading it, right? We're loading it from another game. And then we're adding in these new money data when we save. And then, uh, well, obviously we're ending up in a situation where we have a ton of money data objects out there because we're just adding new ones, new ones, new ones, new ones. So what we need to do is manage this so that we either clear out the money data and just re-add them or that we keep track of them and bind them up at the start. Now, I don't want to go into the binding up at the start because I feel like it's going to get a little too advanced. It's going to take a couple hours to go through that but we can at the very least just clear out this list. So go through here, money data is not clear and save. So this should fix that data so that we don't end up with multiple things in our JavaScript. Let's go take a look at it real quick and see if that fixed it. So, and the other way, by the way, just for anybody who's curious, the thing that I, I don't wanna dive into right now, just because I feel like it'll be a lot of overkill to take a long time, is that we could set up these money data objects and then in a bootstrapper, essentially bind them up to the actual game objects that they link to um, instead of getting them from the objects. So we essentially pass them in, have them work with their data in that object, and then we always have a reference to that object instead of having to get it back out when we save it. So we'd essentially be keeping all of our game data in one spot in memory and just constantly keeping it there and referencing it there. And that, that would be, um, again, the, the, the more advanced way that we're just not gonna get into today. Maybe we'll do that some other time though. All right. So go over here. I've got my two objects. I'm going to save one Go over here, save two. I'm going to load one and then I'm going to go over here and save three. I'm going to pick up these objects again and then do a save three. And then I'm going to look at that JSON data, see if it looks clear. And then we'll uh, go on to the next thing and talk a little bit about Newton soft and JSON serialization too. I'm going to hit a five real quick. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? Oh, yeah, I'll hit a five. I was thinking I would just add a field to it and make it show up, but I already, I'm already in debug mode. I've already hit a five and attach, so let's go through it. All right, so here we are. We've got our JSON data here. And if I go over to the right and hit view and copy this out and just paste this into that page again that I had. Go right here, paste, process, bam. Now I've got money data. So I've got money seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and a zero. Basically, I don't have multiple copies of my money data anymore because we cleared that out. 
it's important to just take a look at your JSON data, I think, when you're saving stuff out too. So when you're saving and like serializing things and loading things, test it, make sure that it works, and ideally set up a unit tested scenario for it so that you can actually make sure that everything works constantly as you change stuff. But so, test it, at the very least, test it when you make any big changes to it. Test it, look at the data, make sure that it actually looks valid on top of working. So you don't end up with like a giant one gigabyte save file that you're not actually using because it's just copies and copies and copies of the data. And I, I have seen stuff like that before where things get saved many times like that and it just grows exponentially. Every time you save it, it doubles the size and yeah, gets big, gets big and bad quick, right? All right, so let's stop playing. And um, there's a little bit of talk about the serialization stuff. So right now we're just using the JSON utility serializer. And that's the built-in one. And it lets you serialize a lot of things, but it is by far not the most powerful serializer. The Newton soft one, the one that's mentioned in chat and the one that a lot of people recommend all the time, the one that I usually use is um, a lot better at catching things and serializing things. It'll automatically serialize a lot of things that the, um, the built-in one won't do. Things like dictionaries. I, I believe Newton soft is dictionaries of all kinds of things, but it does, um, it's been a while since I've had to serialize one though. Uh, but sorry, think thinking in my head real quick. Anyway, it'll serialize a lot of other things like uh, properties and things that you wouldn't serialize with the built-in JSON utility. So if you're interested in serialization stuff and you want to get into serializing other objects and finding that uh, JSON utility is an issue, you can always grab the Newton soft one. There's a free version of it. And I think there's um, some assets in the asset store to grab it too. There may even be a package in the package manager to grab it in now. I'm not completely sure. Um, but you can definitely switch it out. But one other option that you have, let's let's go past player preps for a second. So right now we're saving this data off <laughs> into JSON. Um, and I said that you should check this data and all that, but I haven't actually shown you how to save it off into a file. It's extremely easy to save this stuff into a file on your local file system and then reload that too. So let me show you how to do that. If we wanted to save our JSON data instead of into a player prefs string, into like a text file or a binary file, we can use the stream writer. So what I can do is say using, and then open parentheses, stream writer, stream writer equals new stream writer. And it's gonna want to add some using statements. So I hit alt enter, add my missing references. So I think was a system.io reference, yep. Okay, and then we're gonna go down and the stream writer takes in some parameters. The parameter that we're going to use or the optional parameter setup that we're going to use is just the path to the file name. So if I just put in something like save game, uh, game number dot JSON, that's going to give us a file named save game, whatever one, two or three dot JSON. Now I'll do the open parentheses at the end of it. I need two closing braces here, by the way, because we're using this using statement, which if you're not familiar with it, is part of the, well, it gives you a way to implement the iDisposable interface kind of automatically and cleanly. There's a new way to do this in C Sharp 8. Um, we're not gonna jump into that, or maybe it's nine, but we're not gonna jump into that. What we're gonna do is use the using setup for it so that it automatically cleans up the, the setup or the, uh, the references or the handles to the file. The reason that we write it like this is so that when it leaves the scope of this, it will clear up the references to it by calling the dispose method on the stream writer. This is essentially like a way of writing things that implement iDisposable to minimize the likelihood of screwing them up. If you get an exception or you bail out or something else, essentially if you leave the context, it will clear up the file and not leave it locked. If you've ever had a file that's like sitting there locked that you can't access, it's because somebody didn't dispose of their, their lock on it properly and using statements like this will help prevent that. So we've got our stream writer here and what we want to do is say stream writer dot write and pass in our JSON. Yep, that was it. <laughs> All right, so that's going to write out our data to a file. I'm going to save that off or I'm going to comment out my set string. I'm going to take this little bit here, copy it, go into my load and right here where we do the um, get string part, I'll say using stream writer, blah, 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 or yeah, stream writer this. I'm going to change this to reader instead of writer. And we'll change this one to reader, stream reader. And we'll change this side to reader. And then here we'll say read. And we'll say JSON equals that. 
So this is going, oh, not read. Um, read to end. There we go. That'll read the whole file. The read was just going to read, uh, I think, one character or one byte. So this is going to get us our JSON data. Now I need to bring all of this part of my load method into the scope of my using statement. So I'll just take this brace here, delete it, and move it down here to the end. And now it's auto formatted. And then I need to comment out this little line right here on 20 because I already have my JSON data. Oops. Fix that comment there. I already have my JSON data right here on line 17. So now I'm reading it from a file and saving it off to a file. Let's save it, try it out, see what it looks like, see what the file looks like, and see if it all works. So stop playing. And we'll play one more time. All right. And then we'll run around. Go grab some money, got $2, I'll hit save one. And then let's go look at our file system. So I'm gonna right click here in my, in my project view, hit show and explore, go up to save and load and look at here. In my folder, I've got a save game onejson file. I'll right click and let's hit open with, and let's just open it in, uh, I guess we'll just use notepad for now. I don't know, well, let's open it in writer. Oh, that didn't work out very well. I need to get the formatter set up for JSON in here. I reset it up and I'm not sure what the hotkeys are now. All right, anyway, here's our JSON data saved off. So we've got our JSON in this text file here. And if I go hit save to, go back into our file explorer. See, I now have a save game too. And then this would allow me to give players like literally a save file that they could save off, share with friends, whatever, save off to, you know, whatever some, cache or share it online. I, I don't know what you want to do with the save file. You can save it however you want, or they could go in and modify it. Of course, we can also binary serialize it. So if we want to go away from um, using the JSON, we could switch away from JSON utility to using the binary formatter and then save that off as data. Or we could compress this or uh, base64 encode it is another option that we have to hide what this JSON data looks like in that text file if we wanted to. I generally prefer to just write it in text so that I can read it. And then at the end, start to format it into either something that's, um, a lot of the time I'll just base 64 encode it and then decode it because that's enough for 99.9% .9 of the people who are gonna try to hack my game. But if it's something super important, then I'll um, put more work into it and actually encrypt the data. If it's something where it's going to impact other players. In my experience though, 99% of games, if people hack their local data, it doesn't impact anybody else. Nobody cares and it doesn't really matter. So I don't worry too much about it. Just try to obfuscate it enough with some base 64 encoding or something. In fact, um, I don't know if we should go through that. Like doing some encoding in there. Let me find the, uh, we'd use, let's see, where are we at right here? So here's our data, our JSON data. What we could do is something like um, in our save, let me, let me show you real quick what it looks like when we base 64 encode data. So we've got our JSON data. Let's say var p64 equals convert dot to base 64 string JSON. And then we could save this out. Let's, let's write this instead of our JSON data. Wait a minute, what am I thinking? I'm getting myself mixed up here. No, I need to use my converter, my encoder. Um, encoding. Sorry, I get getting myself mixed up. Right, getting myself. What was it? It's uh. Oh, okay. Give me two seconds to remember this real quick. Then uh, we can format for that again. It's system dot. Ah, there it is. Sorry, everybody. I was just getting myself mixed up um, <laughs> in my text. I'm just going to yank some base64 encoding co code real quick um, off of one of my other projects. Or actually, maybe I'll see, I want the sorry, system.txt dot encoding dot utf8 dot what do 
I forget. Sorry, guys. I'm hot. And, yeah, thank you. Somebody pasted the code in there. That's what I'm looking for. Getting myself mixed up. Oh, did I do encoder instead of encoding? Okay. This is a downside to, uh, to live streaming for too long. I get mixed up and overheated and confused. All right, let me paste this in. So plain text bytes gets us our JSON. There we go. And then this is going to bar B64 is going to give us our base 64 code. So what, what essentially what happens here, and thank you, um, who posted that? Kevin, thank you for posting that in there. I missed a step in here. So essentially what happens is we take our JSON data, that data that I was showing you a little while ago with the braces and all that stuff, and we convert it into a byte array using the text.encoding.utf8.get bytes. This was the step I was just totally spacing on. So this converts it into a byte array, and then that byte array gets turned into a string. So it's essentially turning it into binary data and then turning that binary data into a string again so that we can write it out as text. Again, we could also take this binary data, by the way, this plain text bytes, and just save that out as actual data. But I want to show you what a base64 string looks like because I think people see them all the time and they don't recognize it, don't know what it is. They don't know that they can just decode it as well. So let's go through. I'm going to save it real quick. We'll look at the file, the text of it real quick, and then we'll do the decoding part of it. All right, so we hit play and go run around. We'll go grab a dollar or two. We'll hit save two. Um, actually, let's hit save three. And then let's go look at the file for save three. So right click on it, open. I'm going to just open this in, uh, oh, what did it open in? Writer. So here it is. It's open in Writer. And you can see the file here. So this is my save game three. And it says EUI, JN, blah, 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 blah. And it ends in an equal sign. You'll recognize that. All of them will end in an equal sign if you have these base64 encoded text things. So let's go figure it out. Let's go figure out how we can load that back in. So if we want to load it, we go back to our game persist and then we take um, it's going to be instead of get bytes, it's going to be get text and we'll pass in the byte array and we're going to do from base64 string instead of to base64 string. Let's zoom this out a little bit. Um, let's go up here to the part where we're in fact, I'm going to move this. I'm going to take this method here. We'll take it and we'll move it up here above load. So just so that the text for our stuff is right above it. So let's get rid of that. We'll collapse this down and collapse that. So in our reading data, we're reading it all in right here. And this is no longer going to be JSON data. This is going to be B64 data. So I'm going to rename this to B64. And then we're going to say a string. Um, or no, we want to do a character array first. So we want to do system dot convert dot from base 64 string we're taking our b64 so this is going to give us back our bytes our plain text bytes as it's defined up there which is also just a byte or why am i what am i hitting the wrong key again i kept hitting backspace instead of equals so this is going to give us our plain text bytes array which is a byte array or i could also type this as byte array like this or just bar um, and then we want to convert this byte array into our JSON text. And to do that, we use our, let's see, add a new line here. We'll say string JSON equals, and we want to use system.text.encoding, there we go, dot utf8 dot get string, and we'll pass in our bytes. We pass in the bytes here, or the byte array, and then that will give us back our text. So this is essentially just a real easy, um, easy to use, lightweight way to semi-encrypt or encode the data. It's definitely not hidden because if you know you can do this, you can just take that text and base64 decode it. Let's go try it out and make sure that it works though. All right, so we're in and we load game three and yep, there we go, it worked. But if I load game two, it doesn't work anymore because the data no longer matches. Only game three works. One and two are both broken. But I can go in here and resave over them and now saves one and two and two and three work at least. I haven't fixed one. One's still invalid. It's got bad data. All right. Um I through a lot of things so far. I think the the last thing that I really wanted to get into was saving remotely. So doing like play fab setup or like an, an online re remote save. So you can save it to the cloud, right? I assume everybody's still interested in that. So we'll go a little bit longer and do that part now. If you got, don't mind hitting the thumbs up button though, while we do that, I definitely appreciate it. And then we'll get into um, the play fab process.
been a little while though, so I need to pull up my actual PlayFab object here, or my PlayFab project. You know, maybe I'll just go grab, let me open up that project that I had open and show it. Let's see, where was In this one right here? So the PlayFab setup, if you haven't used PlayFab, by the way, and you're new to it, or you haven't used any cloud saving setup, let me just show you what it looks like. I'm gonna pull up the, the UI. It's free, it's pretty easy to use, and um, I think Microsoft bought them or partnered with them or something. So it, it's gonna be free, I think, for quite a while, or at least available as an option for a while. So let's go through the process real quick of, of how to use this thing. So if you're on the, the PlayFab webpage, right, you go to, let's see, go to PlayFab first. So you can sign up here and essentially it gives you a way to do a lot of different things. Um, I'm not necessarily like pushing that you should definitely use PlayFab over any of the alternatives. Um, I don't use any of them for anything that I'm doing production wise right now. But if you're looking at them, PlayFab is one that gets recommended a lot and the UI, or the, the whole infrastructure and the interface was really easy to use and integrate. So if you're interested in one and you're not sure what to use, I would definitely give it a try. So the main thing that I wanna use from this one is just saving off um, player data. So essentially data management. This is one of the, <clears throat> the many different things um, that we want, that we can do with it. And it's the one thing that I actually care about. In fact, it's not even really that one. It's really this one, cross network identity and data where we're gonna have player specific data. And um, to set it up, all I did was sign up a new account and then create an app. So I went in and then hit new game, or I think I hit new studio and then new game, and then created a, a game in here. Um, I wanna go through my open project and show what that looks like real quick. And then um, maybe I'll go through the process of setting it up, but I'm kind of running out of breath right now. So let's just show how you use it and how you could integrate this existing stuff with what we've already done and see just how easy it is. Okay, so we've got here this project. Let me load up my sample scene and make sure that it works. So for this project, all I've done is load in the um, the player, uh, the, the PlayFab SDK. So I grabbed the PlayFab SDK, pulled it in and made a single script here, a PlayFab login script. Let's make it open up a new window here that allows us to see what it does. So my PlayFab login script doesn't do much. This was me kind of experimenting with PlayFab, seeing how it works, how you deal with a login and how you save a little bit of data to it. It's actually extremely freaking simple. So the way that this thing works is, um, well, let's see. Let's go into Unity real quick and pull it up. I think if I show the code without showing the, the UI and stuff and talking about it, it might be a little bit more confusing. So I'll hit play. And then we'll look at the elements real quick and then talk about how it all works. So let's see, pause. I don't wanna be in maximize mode. Uncheck maximize, there we go. Okay, so by default, I'm already logged in as jwyman1. So it logged me in as my last user, but I also gave myself the ability to register by putting in a username, a password, and an email address. I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna say this is a live Jason 10. Uh, my password will be, I don't know, doesn't really matter. And my email plus live 10 at gmail.com. So I can register my account and then I can save some data off. So when I've done that, when I register the account, let's go see what it does. So I'm going to go look at my button here. I think this is my register button, right? Yep. It calls my playfab login dot register method. I'm going to go look at that real quick, see how that works and how we register an account in playfab. So assuming I've got my SDK set up, the, setting up the SDK, I don't wanna run through it right now, but it was essentially import the package, put in your codes that it gave you. So when you create your project, it'll give you some codes for your project. You put those in, that's it, SDK works. You don't have to do anything else. You do, however, need to make the calls to do like registration and login and all that stuff if you wanna do it, not use their example scenes. So to register, we create a register request. When I hit that button, we create a register prefab or playfab user request, which just takes the username, the password, and the email as the three parameters. And I'm putting those in using the, um, the syntax right here. So we can set the properties on them. And then we call playfab client API register playfab user, pass in that registration message or that request right there. And then some callbacks for when we succeed or fail. 
if we succeed, which is the only case that I'm going to deal with right now. Oh, in either case, we save the password in the email. That's how we're logging back in. So if we succeed, we say, hey, that we registered and we save the username as well. The last thing that we do is log in and that happens on start. So that's why when I registered, I wasn't actually logged in because my code wasn't quite smart enough. It only does the register, saves it off in a username. And then in our start method, I look to see if I have my username and password saved off, if I have them both here. So if they're not null, this is a terribly written if statement. Um, then we call and generate a login request. So create a new login request, call PlayFab client API, log in with PlayFab and pass in that request. And then we get a login success message or event and a login failure method. The final bit of things, the part where we would hook all of this up. So the part that makes it all work is we've got a um, button down here. Let's, let's go back into Unity. Button down here to save our data and to load some data. So if you look here, we have this get user data method or this get user data call that we're calling whenever we successfully log in. If I hit F12 and go to it and see what it actually does. It sends another request. So the way that all of these APIs work is you send a request and you're gonna get a callback. You're gonna get some event back. So you might've noticed that with the other ones, we had events that we sent off and some success and failure events that we get back. We're doing the same thing here, but here I'm just doing it without methods and we're doing a Lambda statement instead. So instead of passing in these as methods for parameters, they're just passed in as um, Lambdas that are kind of built kind of, or there, that are parameters of this thing. A little bit harder to read, but essentially what we're doing is saying, we'll get the user data and if we get a success, so this one is the success, we'll run this code right here. And the, this code will say, if the data contains a level key, then set our text to whatever that level key is. Now this level could be whatever we wanna call it. We call it um, JSON data, because that's what it is. We could call it game one data, because it could be game one data or game two data or anything else. And then we just load that in. Now the part where we save it, the final piece of the puzzle is this little save button. If I go to it and select it, I'm pretty sure it's just calling a save method here in PlayFab. Yeah, it's calling save user data, which again, just generates an update user request. So we create a new request. These are again, the PlayFab objects. These are PlayFab objects and you'll see this exact code in their example API. If you go through their API, you'll see it, um, that they exactly how to do this as well. You see all the code for it. But what we do here is we send an update user data request and we pass in the data as a dictionary of key value pairs. So what we would do here is say JSON or game data one or level one or whatever we want to call it and then pass in that JSON data instead of the text that's in my text box. And that's pretty much it. If we do that, we can get the data to and from PlayFab and then load and save it. Um, unfortunately, I'm running out of breath and it's getting loud outside and I've got to take a little kid on a drive in just a minute. So I think I'm going to wrap this up in just a second. But then what I'm going to do next is turn this into a full-fledged um, tutorial. So like a step-by-step of how to do the persistent stuff, kind of well edited, cut down, trimmed to the specific points. Um, and then I think I'll add in the PlayFab step and the PlayFab setup as kind of the, the last step in there, step by step on that too. So if you're interested in that stuff, make sure that you're subscribed and you hit the, the like button or thumbs up button or just leave a comment below because if this thing is really popular, then it means I should definitely be doing um, lots of persistent stuff. But I sent out a poll on persistence things. Let me switch to camera view. And it was by far like the most popular thing that I asked about. So I really wanted to at least get into it, get something out today, go through the process real quick, and then give you guys all something that you can really use um, again afterwards. So we'll go step by step on it. Um, this will also be available for you. So you'll be able to go through and watch it again as soon as it's done processing or kind of skip through stuff. Just make sure that you hit subscribe, like, share, and all that stuff. Um, I definitely appreciate it. And you know, almost out of stuff to say. I did put a link up for the hoodies on the, the game.courses site. If you're interested in those, you can check them out. Um, and if you have questions about this persistent stuff, just shoot me an email because if there's stuff that I missed or was confusing, uh, it'll be helpful in the new video that I'm going to do for this. So I'm going to go through the whole process. And if you've got, uh, yeah, if you have thoughts or just feedback or ideas or questions that you think would be useful in there, let me know, just send them to me an email and I'll, um, I'll read through them and try to get back to you on that too and get them in there. All right. Thanks again, everybody for coming out. Um, I'm exhausted, but had a great time and 
uh, had a blast with this. I hope everybody enjoyed it and learned something useful, figuring out some some cool game dev stuff. And we'll do a lot more of these. Uh, do another one next week, and I'll see you all soon.